Yeah. Everybody else is still in, uh, busy in the labs. <clears throat> well, I, I have to look at the schedule just to, to see whether we can really accommodate more. Here's some more. Not yet. Um, I want <clears throat> to uh, make a couple of announcements uh, before we get going. Um, um, so the talk I want to give today, and I, I'll caution you, my voice may not hold out. I've got a little bit of a sore throat. Um, so I've got my water here, ready to go, if my voice uh, doesn't make it. Um, I wanted to talk to you about photonics, which is my own field of specialty. I spent most of my career, actually, at uh, Bell Laboratories was as a research member and uh, a director and then a vice president there uh, prior to going into academics. And the group I had discussion with at lunch, we spent a lot of time talking about industry going in and out of academics and so forth. And that's something that's not really that uncommon in, these, in some of the more research intensive um, uh, industrial R&D labs in the country. Th these days, those, a lot of those are with the IT companies, uh, outfits like Microsoft, Google, and, and so forth um, have R&D organizations with a very academic uh, flavor to them. So I want to talk to you about photonics. And uh, last year when I was uh, on, on vacation, I had just come back and I, I was thinking about photonics everywhere. And you know, is it really everywhere? And feeling like the answer was yes, because I uh, had a beautiful afternoon up in San Francisco with family. And we were going across the bridge. And on the other side of the bridge, up on the Point, Point Bonita, there's a really nifty lighthouse there. And if you ever get a chance to go see it, it's just kind of fun. The reason I'm bringing it up here is I was a little surprised at how much photonics there was in this uh, lighthouse of all things. So if you go inside there and look at what's there, there's this uh, incredible uh, lens there, Fresnel lens. And, but it's not just the optics. It's what's, what's making this thing tick. So here's an example of the design of one of these um, uh, high order Fresnel lenses that capture an enormous amount of light. And back in the day, they came from oil lamps. And uh, you know, people would burn these very hot filament uh, oil lamps. And with modern technology, that's getting replaced by photonics. So here we are uh, in 2016, last year. And, and that at the heart of this uh, lens system is a bulb that's uh, comprised of um, gallium nitride LEDs of all things. So these are the things that you're now finding in all your flashlights. And maybe for your generation, that's a big yawn. Um, but for us growing up, uh, the kind of emergence of uh, LED lighting and the cost savings and benefit of that is it's a very high impact thing. In fact, it's so high impact that one of our colleagues, uh, um, Shuji Nakamura, who's out at UC Santa Barbara, was the recipient of the Nobel Prize in 2014 for his work along with several colleagues on, uh, on gallium nitride LEDs. So here's a, an example of what one of these little, little bulb chips looks like. It's actually a substrate with a phosphor overlay. And on there, there's a, a dye of indium gallium nitride, which is a compound, 3,5 compound semiconductor material um, that emits in the ultraviolet. And so ultraviolet, you put current in and it emits ultraviolet photons, and those photons then hit the phosphor and emit broadly over a wide spectrum. And that's what gives you all your new headlights and flashlights and light bulbs and so forth. Not, not these, but uh, the ones that you now get in Home Depot and, and Lowe's and everywhere else. Um, so this stuff is uh, kind of having impact everywhere. And that was really the, the point of that um, little message. So we, I think I mentioned in the uh, intro, we, we were all challenged by explaining to people what optics and photonics is. And everybody you know, immediately thinks of eyeglasses and things like that. And 
one of our comebacks that we've are in the community that we've picked up on that people can relate to a little bit more is something like that, like an iPhone or a cell phone. And we say, no, this, this is a much better example of what photonics is. And if you think about this, it's, it kind of defines your modern life. You can't go anywhere without it. You can't figure out where you are. You can't get directions. You can't communicate. You can't surf the web without your connectivity. Um, so this is a wonderful example of photonics, and it's in many, many ways. So one of them is that that display itself, you know, very high resolution color display, is a pretty remarkable piece of technology. That's that's all photonics. Some of these are now emerging with uh, with um, um, polymer LED uh, flexible um, uh, displays. Um, so it's that in itself is some amazing photonics. Inside, I think uh, Khan mentioned, there's a lot of laser machining that goes into creating these precision cases and the molds that are used for those cases. So those are some examples of photonics that are inside these things. Uh, it's not foreign for many of us to think back to when the cell phone cameras came out. It was such a joke because they were so bad. You know, it was like, you've got to be kidding me. You can't put a camera in your phone. Um, and now how many of you still carry any kind of a point and shoot camera anymore? I, you know, almost nobody. Um, and it's because the quality of these has gotten to be so good. Is this lighting okay? I don't know if we can turn down the, I don't know if there's an easy way to do it. Is that still very visible? Is it easy to see? Maybe that's a little better, okay. Um, so this is an extreme example. There's lots and lots of lens elements in this particular one, but it's a very high quality sequence of lenses and then a, a, a CMOS camera. Um, a sensor in there with you know up, upwards of 15 you know megapixels or 20 mega, megapixels on some of the best cameras now. So the fact that you would get that not only on the front, I mean on the back of the camera, but you got one or two on the front, and now you've got, uh, as someone said earlier, now we've got uh, uh, arrays of vertical cavity surface emitting lasers on there that do face recognition from Apple, and they're s starting to hog the market of uh, LED. I'm sorry, of uh, a vertical cavity semiconductor laser manufacturers to supply that market. So that, that's a great example of photonics. The more important one in here is you look at the integrated circuits that are in there, and today mobility is now the driver for uh, integration. Um, and the, the silicon chips now have upwards of uh, 7 billion transistors uh, on a single chip. And that's all done with the most remarkable printing cameras um, that are, you know, lithography systems that are now going into the extreme ultraviolet uh, in vacuum systems because the light for the exposure can't even propagate in air, gets absorbed. Um, but the, those systems are able to print these uh, microcircuits with uh, feature sizes down on the scale of nanometers. And that's some pretty amazing optics right there. Here's an example of one of those lithography tools. Uh, even more compelling is you think of the wireless connectivity you've got back to some central station, but the internet that is the backbone for your smartphone is all fiber optics. And so the globe is circled with fibers, and the latest um, systems, research systems, have demonstrated capacity on a single fiber. So you pluck a hair out, that's about the dimension of an optical fiber. Um, of things on the order of a petabit per second, 10 to the 15th bits per second. Just to give you a handle on what that means, if you took every family in the United States with their internet connection and got them downloading at full bore, you know, let's say 20 megabits per second, downloading a file, um, every single family could do that on one fiber. Uh, that's how much information capacity you can fit on one single optical fiber. Uh, if you look at, again, when you use the internet, you're thinking about going from city to city, but what you're actually doing is activating a bunch of computers that are connected and talking to each other inside these data centers. And these things hog up so much power, they sit next to hydroelectric dams, they need all kinds of cooling from the river, uh, or some of them are located up north where it's fundamentally cooler. Um, <coughs> so these data centers, they really are the internet today. Um, and data centers talk to each other, but most of the information that you get, you know, as you do keystrokes and you're on Amazon or something like that, and it's, it's anticipating your next keystroke uh, with what it thinks you want to know or what ad it wants to show you or what 
recent purchase it wants to show you, it's doing that by pulling together all kinds of stuff within this data center. And in the inside of those data centers, you've got upwards of a million lasers and optical fibers connecting rack after rack after rack of servers inside the data center. So when you think of your cell phone and you think of photonics, it, it relies on all, all of that stuff. So it's a much better example of photonics than a pair of eyeglasses, I think. Optics and photonics. <coughs> so um, when we use the term photonics, some people rightfully ask, what do you, you know, why do you say photonics instead of optics? There's not a really solid answer to that. But usually when we use the term photonics, we're referring to uh, cases where the particle nature of light is a useful engineering concept or, or in some cases fundamental to understanding what's going on. Uh, most of those involve optoelectronics where you're converting light from, uh, into electricity. So in either a photo detector and an image sensor or a, um, or a laser, a semiconductor, opto, uh, semiconductor laser or an LED, something like that, where you're generating light, absorbing light, converting it to electricity and so forth. So examples of that are lasers, LEDs, communications, um, guided wave photonic integrated circuits, nonlinear optics, fields we call plasmonics, uh, and some fundamental optoelectronic materials such as the gallium nitride advance that I showed you uh, earlier. So these are just some examples of things that are photonics. And I want to run you through some of these to bring them, make them a little more graphic to you. Um, to be uh, a uh, guru in the field of photonics, you need, you need a tool belt. And as a, uh, as a student, you'll want to take a lot of physics-y courses. You know, I, I was thinking about my own education. I, I started out in physics, and I was very happy to have had the pleasure of having three Nobel Prize winners for my teachers and um, knowing probably two dozen more throughout my career. Uh, so it's a very physics-y kind of field. And part of that is because in order to engineer solutions in this area, you really need this stuff. It's, you need quantum mechanics. It's not just something interesting and it's interesting science. It's, it's critical to engineer the solutions you need. Same thing, you need all the optics and Maxwell equations. You need a lot of electrical engineering. You need semiconductor device physics. And you know something that you might think is esoteric, like quantum field theory, is no longer a esoteric topic. It's part of your, your uh, engineering tool belt kit, because you can't even make some of the technology and understand how to design the solutions unless you understand some of the fundamentals of quantum field theory. So it's kind of fun. Uh, you get to actually put all that stuff to real use. You know, sometimes you find yourself, you know, why am I busting myself trying to learn all this stuff? The, an the answer is it actually matters and you can actually use it to make products and, and come up with really cool uh, solutions. So what are some examples of this? Um, here at the um, University of Arizona, we, we are happy to lead a, uh, one of the engineering research centers for the National Science Foundation. And it's actually the only, so a large team of outstanding partners. We are just one of many, but we did lead it. And it's the only one in the country that's in the field of uh, optical communication technology. So this is fiber optics for communications, as I was showing you earlier, for the internet, for data centers, and so forth. Um, so this engineering research center, uh, by design, they cover the whole spectrum all the way from system architecture for fiber communication systems all the way into um, technologies for, um, for the nodes. How do you switch light? How do you route light? How do you detect and manipulate it, uh, encode it, and all the way down into very fundamental physics, some of which won't see the light of day you know, anytime soon, but NSF likes to see you doing the very fundamental work as well. So this engineering research center is in that field of optical communication. And there's a lot of neat stuff that came out of, uh, together with partners making ridiculously small nanoscale lasers that are like, you know, 10, maybe 100 nanometers in, in dimension, that kind of scale, just maybe a few hundred nanometers and uh, covered with metal. So they rely on plasmonics and all kinds of fun physics to try to understand how they work and how you can optimize them. Another part of the optical communications field is in, if today the big, the major reason you have this enormous capacity in an optical communication system is wavelength division multiplexing. And what that means is on a single fiber, you have a whole bunch of different colors. 
so each color carries a particular time domain signal, uh, on off, you know, digital representation of data, but then you have all these different colors and they can co-propagate in the fiber, I'll say nominally without interfering with each other, although I'll get to that in a second. Um, so you send that, you combine all these different wavelengths. They're, I say colors, they're in the infrared. It's in the 1.3, 1.5 micron range. Um, so you can't see it, but, but they're different wavelengths, different, different uh, frequencies. And you transmit all these different things and then you combine it together. And then you can send it over really long distances, such as across the ocean um, under sea, by just continually boosting the signal with optical amplifiers. And optical amplifiers, Khan talked to you earlier about the fiber optic gain material. So you put a gain medium in and you pump light into this uh, fiber that gets absorbed. And then when your signal light comes in, it causes stimulated emission and it comes out brighter than it, did, than it did when it went in. So it boosts up the signal and it frankly doesn't care what the information is on it. So it's a cheap, easy way to boost a signal that's carrying gobs of information because there's all these different colors and it boosts them all at once. It doesn't really care. Um, so it's, it was a wonderful advance that really changed the architecture of optical communication systems. Uh, one of the reasons I'm dwelling on this is to understand these amplifiers. You know, one of the limiting factors is the noise accumulation, optical noise accumulation that comes up in these amplifiers. And to understand that, you really have to get into the fundamental relationship between gain and uh, stimulated emission, spontaneous emission. And, you know, frankly, you can do that with Einstein A-B coefficients and so forth, but that's kind of an empirical concept um, to really understand the foundation of how you analyze that stuff. That's a good case where quantum field theory becomes very important, understanding the quantum nature of light to uh, engineer those solutions. And we make fibers. I think Khan talked to you a little bit about that. I don't know that he showed you these slides. So down in our ground floor, we've got a fiber draw tower. We're not in the business of competing with companies to make uh, communication fiber. This is more about funky materials. So we can make fibers that uh, work at wavelengths out in the mid-infrared or other, other wavelength regimes that are not commercially addressed right now. So the question is, you know, can you do it? Um, and, and sometimes there's opportunities to change the characteristics by making uh, funky fibers. This is called microstructured or photonic crystal fiber. And you can make uh, very unusual propagation characteristics by making preforms that have weird patterns. And then when you draw, I don't know if you've seen a fiber draw tower, it starts out with a boule of glass and you melt it. And when you pull it, it's a little bit like your pancake syrup. When you pour it on the pancake and you pull it away and there's this really fine thread that comes off. And if you pull it, on this melting boule of glass, it'll come off in this incredibly uniform uh, long strand and you can pull, you know, 100 kilometers of fiber off a boule or something like that. Um, and it retains that structure. So if you make a macro structure with weird features, it shrinks down by, you know, orders of magnitude down into this micron scale thing, but it keeps all those little things in it. So it's, it's a pretty nifty technology. I mentioned all these colors go down the fiber without contaminating, uh, you know, messing with each other. Like if you take two flashlights in a vacuum and shoot them and cross the beams, despite what you see in Star Wars, um, they don't clash with each other. And um, um, that's not entirely a true statement. Actually, light will scatter light. Um, there's a cross section for doing that because of uh, pair creation in a vacuum. Um, there, you can scatter light with light, um, but it's a very, very uh, low, low cross section event. And a fiber, unfortunately, it's not. And this is an example that shows two wavelengths that are one angstrom apart. That's about 12 gigahertz um, in uh, frequency. And they propagate down the fiber. And after 100 kilometers, they look OK. But after 600 kilometers, you see this garbage on the side. And after 1,000 kilometers, it's a mess. After 1,500 kilometers, it's total garbage. And what's happening there is these two wavelengths go down the fiber at the same time, they're slightly different frequencies, so they beat with each other. That means the intensity in the fiber at any given point is going like this. It's, it's going back and forth at that beat frequency, 12 gigahertz. Well, if I look at e either one of these things now and I say, well, here it is propagating along down the fiber and it's seeing a medium with an intensity that's changing at 12 gigahertz. When that intensity changes, it turns out the nonlinear effect of the, of the fiber is that the index of refraction changes with intensity. It's called the Kerr effect. So that means the index is doing this at 12 gigahertz. And when the light goes through, that scatters light. 
into a neighboring channel that was 12 gigahertz away. And then that one scatters in, and you just keep creating these sidebands. So that's a bad thing. So fiber nonlinearities is part of photonics. There's a good thing that comes with fiber nonlinearities, and that's uh, something we call parametric amplification or four-wave mixing. And that same phenomena can be used in a positive way. So if I have a big, strong signal, I'll call a pump, and I come in with a signal, um, that signal will beat with the pump, and it'll do exactly what I just said, um, but it'll rob some of the energy out of the pump, and the signal will grow. So you can actually get amplification of a signal through this nonlinear process. And it turns out it has wonderful characteristics, different characteristics in noise um, than some of the noise you might get from some um, stimulated emission kind of amplifiers. So again, that goes back to really understand that you want to do the quantum field theory of nonlinear parametric amplification. Not that hard to do, but you know that's part of your tool belt is learning how to do things like that. So here's an example showing actual experimentally measured gain uh, as a function of separation from the, from, the, um, from the original pump frequency. And it's a very real phenomena. And Khan showed you this. I don't have to dwell on that. So part of it is, how can you make compact things? And here's an example of one of his Modlock lasers that he now sells from his company, K Photonics, out of his, the garage of his home. You can buy one. Uh, probably, I think it's, a, maybe it's 10K. I don't know what his current price is. But it's a lot cheaper than a Thai Sapphire laser. And he's able to do all kinds of crazy things, um, generating continuum, generating very ultra-short femtosecond scale pulses. And he showed you his uh, adventures in microscopy. So I'm not going to dwell on that. But these are examples of what we would call photonics as well. It's the fiber communication, the nonlinear optics part of it. Um, arrays, so detector arrays. Here's an example here at the University of Arizona off campus. We have a facility that makes enormously large um, CCD arrays for astronomy applications. And we ship them to customers all over the world. And it, uh, we end up being consortium partners in, um, in, in generating these, uh, we, you know, we refer to it as assets. So astronomy assets, big telescopes all over the world. No, nobody <coughs> has an eyepiece and looks in the camera, I mean, looks in the telescope anymore. It's all done with very, very high quality low, low noise imagers that allow you to capture the data and, and analyze it um, uh, very carefully. So this is another example of photonics. This is an example of some research that uh, Stanley Pow and our faculty does with um, cameras. This shows individual pixels of a camera where each pixel, <coughs> excuse me, each pi pixel can not only detect whether there's light there, um, but it can detect what kind of polarization it has. Is it linear polarized this way, this way, circular polarized, et cetera? And it can give you what we refer to as the full Stokes vector for every single pixel on the camera. So when you take pictures of things, not only are you getting the image and the color and all that, but you're getting a mapping of all the polarization characteristics of the light coming off of it, which is very important for a lot of um, uh, science and, and um, remote sensing applications and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. I was afraid this was going to happen. So I want to give you some another example of something we call photonic integrated circuits and integrated optics. A lot of our faculty work on that, and it's, it's kind of a hot field, uh, continues to be a hot field right now. Um, so if you look at integrated optics, what this refers to is kind of chip scale solutions where rather than having lenses and imaging, you've got light zipping around in the plane of a chip. Uh, in waveguides, almost like wires in an integrated circuit, but instead it's, it's waveguides. And instead of transistors, we've got modulators, we've got splitters, couplers, detectors, um, uh, lasers, and so forth, all of this on a chip. So in order to work in that field, there had to be a lot of advances in modeling and how do you generate all these lithographic structures. A lot of it is borrowed from microelectronics. Um, the, uh, so you don't have to keep reinventing things. Um, we can use um, those lithography systems I talked about earlier and, and earlier versions of those. But we also have to have epitaxy where you grow layers of crystals. And I'll, I'll show an example of that. Epitaxy is different than just deposition. So you're used to hearing about thin film deposition where you put down a film and you put down another layer or something like that. With epitaxy, it's actually a continuation of a crystal substrate. So when you put down atoms, they are aligned to the crystal lattice 
of the structure underneath, and it's a continuation of the same crystal, even though you might change materials. So you can have a single crystal that goes from one thing to another to another, but if you were to look at that carefully, each atom row lines up perfectly and so forth. So it's a very pure, very high performance way of doing multi-layer films. So some real high impact successes in the field of integrated optics. One of them was uh, modulators. So for many years, lithium niobate modulators were the way that people would encode information for these fiber optic systems. Still is in many, many, many cases. Um, so here's an example where the light comes in here. It gets split into two, fat, two paths, and you send an electrical signal down here. So one optical path is here, the other one's there. The electrical signal here uses the electro-optic effect, which where a voltage applied to a crystal will change the index of refraction. And I can delay the phase in one arm versus the other with my electrical signal. Well, when they come back together and recombine, if they're in phase, they add constructively. If they're out of phase, they add destructively, and I'll get a zero, so a one or a zero, depending on what the electrical signal was flying through this device. So that became a very important component. Another one, and I was talking at lunch with the group I was eating with about uh, semiconductor lasers. So the distributed feedback laser was another very important advance um, where rather than having two mirrors and a laser cavity, you may only have one mirror, and then instead of the other mirror, you have this corrugation or grating. And this is set up, actually I'll go to the next slide and talk about that a little bit. So it's a wonderful story, um, and these are colleagues I had at, back at Bell Labs who were the inventors of this. And when they had their patent, they really, they really anticipated everything because this was a way to make a laser that didn't need mirrors. You could put it in the middle of a substrate and a chip in a waveguide, and, um, and it was fit for integration. Not only that, but it emitted in a single frequency exactly what you wanted for a communication system. Um, so they kind of anticipated all this. But before you could do it well, we really needed all these advances in epitaxy. And here's one um, common technique. It's not widely used in, uh, in production because it's a vacuum system and you have to load it and unload it. But it's, it's one of the most high performance ways to grow epitaxial uh, semiconductor structures. And it's done by, um, it's, it's a, a molecular beam epitaxy um, where individual molecules will impinge on the surface and if it's at the right temperature they have enough mobility on the surface to find the right lattice site to be on and they will automatically stick in the right place and you can grow layer after layer of doing that. So here's an example. Actually, this is a, the more common industrial technique called metal organic vapor phase epitaxy. You'll also hear it. Um, um, yeah, I won't go into that. Um, so it, it's similar, except you flow gases over the surface, and they decompose, and they land on the surface and create structures. And here's an example of different materials layered together. And as I showed you, if you look at a line through this, you see that it's all lined up. It's a single crystal, but it has changed from gallium arsenide phosphide to indium gallium arsenide here. Um, it turns out that's a lower energy. An electron in that system, uh, it's what we call a quantum well. An electron will prefer to reside in this, in this layer than in here. In fact, if there's one here and it goes dribbling along through diffusion and it finds this region, it'll fall into the well and it'll get stuck here. But these things are so thin that when you predict the optical properties of electrons and holes in the semiconductor in this material, you need quantum mechanics to do it accurately. So, um, so this is another example where innovations in materials and structures over many, many decades led to dramatic reductions in the amount of current it took to get a semiconductor laser to work. Back in the early days when you know, laser was just invented, people very quickly said, ah, you know, semiconductors will be a good way to make a laser. And you could do it, but you had to really hit it with a hammer to make it work. And it's because they had no way to make good waveguides in the system. They had no way to contain the gain excitation in a nice region. So uh, a number of folks, uh, Alfarov and uh, Herb Cromer, also at UC Santa Barbara. Alf uh, Zoris Alfarov is at the Yaffe Institute in the Soviet Union, or a former Soviet Union in Russia. Um, they got the Nobel Prize as well for this advance. And it was because they discovered simultaneously not only could they make a structure where the electrical excitation got contained, but it turned out this also had a higher index of refraction. So it mean, that means it had a, made a waveguide. 
because if you have a high index medium surrounded by lower index stuff, the light gets totally internally reflected and it'll get contained. So you put your excitation and your, and your, um, your gain and your optics all in the same place in a, in a really well engineered solution. And that was enough to get them a Nobel Prize. So here's, here's an example of what a modern semiconductor laser, DFB laser looks like. And if I blow this up and I look at these cross sections, Here's an end-on view of what that looks like. And there's all these crazy layers in there. This is the active layer that I was talking about. So this is the end-on view of a waveguide where light will propagate along there. Um, um, but the reason these other layers are here is to block current. So if I put electrical current through this PN junction, so this is P-type material, N-type material, uh, the current tries to flow everywhere, but it can't flow through these regions. So even if I put current out here, it has to flow right through the active layer, which is exactly what you want. And you can engineer these really carefully to have outrageously good behavior at high temperature and, and so forth. If we do a blow up and look at the side view of this layer, underneath it you can see these little blocks of material, and that's this corrugated grating that I was talking about. So the optical mode in this waveguide would be confined here, but part of its energy would be down in this layer. And as it gets propagated along, you get a little reflection from each one of these things. Each reflection is minuscule. But if they're in phase, over a lot of them, they add up to a very strong reflection, but only at the wavelength where they're in phase. So it gives you a single frequency reflector, which makes a single frequency laser. And that quantum well, the gain medium I talked about, is actually a whole bunch of quantum wells. So here's a view of what that actually looks like. You see the uh, waveguide layers, and then these darker layers in there are all the quantum wells that make this thing work. So again, a lot of very good physics, semiconductor materials development. That continued in, in the field. Uh, this is what's called a quantum cascade laser. And what was kind of nifty about this is almost all lasers rely on, on atomic transitions that nature gives you. You know, if you get a semiconductor, it's, it's inherent to that material that there's a band gap. If you get an atom that's lasing between different states or a crystal, um, those are states that nature give you, gave you, and you did spectroscopy, you figured out where they are. This was an example where the, where the quantum states were not natural at all. They're completely man-made. So you, uh, by devising this wild repetitive structure, you could, you could design something where it would have an excited state up here that could emit uh, light and then go to this lower state. And the reason these states exist were strictly because of the periodic structure that you put in by doing this ridiculously complicated MBE crystal growth. So it was kind of a tour de force of quantum mechanics, you know, people saying, this really should work. You know, it wasn't something you saw in nature at all. It was just, it was speculation that you should be able to make something like this, um, try it over and over again, and finally got it to work. And now you can buy these. Um, they're uh, common sources now for the um, uh, infrared wavelengths in the 5 to 20 micron kind of range, something like that very compact, high efficiency sources. Um, so, so I want to talk about photonic integration now. Um, the vision <coughs> of photonic integration, it was a lot like uh, integrated circuits. You know, in, in the electronics world, people used to have bulk circuits, say transistors, and you would string them together and you'd go buy a TO can for a transistor and you'd buy resistors and capacitors and you'd make a circuit and you'd make a radio and you'd go, oh wow, that's really great. You know, if you tried to make today's cell phone using technology like that, um, it would be a, the size of a large building, literally, um, to get that much stuff in it. And more fundamentally, it would never work because the reliability and the reproducibility would be so bad, uh, it would never work. So. People felt they should be able to do the same thing with optics. You know, what applications in optics could we do at the chip scale? Um, and this field was kind of born, um, well, this is already, already wrong. It's, uh, you know, it's 48 years ago now, 49 years ago. Um, and it predicted that, you know, if we did it well, we could use photolithographic techniques just like microelectronics to print waveguide structures and and make miniature laser beam circuits and so forth. So this was the vision. And you know, here's, a, here's a cartoon that kind of showed what kind of things people had in mind. They might be able to have fibers that had tunable lasers and modulators to encode the information. 
uh, switches to route the light from one place to another, detectors and, and so forth. Um, so it was a nice cartoon and people marched off and started saying, well, let's try to do it. Let's see what we can do. The earliest commercial uh, successes of this were really simple. They were just examples of a laser and a modulator. So rather than turning the laser on and off rapidly, which is what most systems did at the time, turns out when you do that, you jostle the wavelength. And it's very fundamental um, to when you change the gain to go from one state to another, you also change the, uh, it's the kramers kronig relationship, for those of you who know that, you can't change gain without changing real index of refraction. So when you modulate a semiconductor laser, the wavelength goes like this a little bit, and that's enough to smear out the pulse as it propagates down a fiber. So people wanted to modulate things um, without turning the laser on and off, and the way you do that is make a DFB laser and then follow it with a modulator, and you can do that in a single chip. If you look here, you'll see the quantum wells start out kind of thick and then they get skinny. Well, what, what good does that do? Um, let, let's, these things rely on something called the Franz Keldish effect. Um, so if I look at a semiconductor and I look at band to band transitions and I have an electron that's absorbed and promoted from the uh, conduction band or the valence band into the conduction band and leaves a hole behind, that will happen as long as the energy of the photon is larger than the band gap of that semiconductor. Um, so what happens when it's less than the band gap of the semiconductor? Then I don't get any absorption. The light just goes shooting through like it's a piece of glass. It doesn't get absorbed. Um, but, so here's an example that shows that. This photon doesn't have enough energy to get there, so it goes shooting through. But if I put an electric field on this thing, this shows the bands, a point in that band tilting with space, and that's because this is an energy level, and when you have electric field times distance, that's a voltage. So that means the energy as it moves along the field will change. Um, and what that means is when I try to have this transition, even though it doesn't have enough energy to get there, that electron says to itself, wow, oh, geez, if I was only 50, 50 angstroms away, if I was there, I'd have enough energy to do it. Well, where's, what does quantum mechanics tell you? It says, uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says you can't contain the, you can't define the position of an electron precisely without having a huge uncertainty in its energy or momentum. And what this says is, uh, it turns out there will be some absorption because that electron cannot be localized that much. If you tried to localize it that much, it would have a huge spread in energy. So fundamentally you get absorption if you put an electric field on this. It's called the Franz Keldish effect. When I was a graduate student, um, I, my office mate, I mean, this is kind of embarrassing because uh, um, he was telling me he was reading this Russian paper, this Franz Keldish effect. He thought it was really cool. And he wanted to do research on it because he thought it would be a good way to turn on and off a laser. And my answer was, oh, come on. Hey, come on, give me a break. People, they, they already know all this stuff. You know, what do you, you know, don't, don't waste your time on that. Well, uh, 10 years later, I was running uh, the R&D for a business that was making a billion dollars a year selling devices that did exactly what he said. So, so stick to your guns. Uh, don't let people talk you out of it. Um, so here's an example. I, you know, Jason showed you, you use the Schrodinger equation, you turn the crank, you put in the potentials, you solve the value, you know, the problem. When you do that for this particular case, this is the expression you get for the absorption coefficient. You know, he mentioned the atom was analytical. This is actually analytical too. It's quite remarkable. And this shows you the variation in absorption as a function of wavelength depending on the value of the electric field. So as you goose up the electric field, you get more absorption. So all of this is to explain how this device works. Here's the laser. It's emitting light into this region. And this is the Franz Keldish region where I put a voltage on there and if I crank it up high enough, I'll get absorption and I can extinguish that light coming out of that laser. So if you're astute, you might ask yourself, well, how in the world do I achieve that cartoon? I've got quantum wells that go from one thickness to another in the same device. Well, people are very clever. They, um, they, they came up with a whole bunch of crystal growth techniques. This one is called uh, selective area growth. And people observed that if they were growing on a substrate, using these gas phase 
uh, vapor phase epitaxy techniques, you've got all your constituents and they're floating around on the surface. Turns out they don't like to stick to the glass because they don't have the right lattice structure. They don't really stick there. But if they land on the crystal surface, they like it and they stick there. So you've got all these guys floating around and they're not sticking here, but they do want to stick there. Well, this is a plan view of a, of a crystal. And it, in this region right here, so this is looking top down, here's these two regions, you're going to get enhanced crystal growth in this region. And that means if you grew quantum wells, they're going to be thicker here than they would out here where you don't have any of this oxide. Because out here, it grows everywhere. So all the same constituents kind of land uniformly. So sure enough, you grow the stuff and you look at this region versus this region, you see thick quantum wells and thin quantum wells. So it turns out you can grow this all in a single growth, works beautifully, and as I said, made uh, billions of dollars a year in, uh, in product sales. So that was a simple device, just two, you know, laser and a modulator. People quickly spanned out into more complex devices, more sophisticated tunable lasers, where you change the index of refraction of that grading region, and that means the wavelength where it reflects changes, so you can make a cavity that has tunable filters inside it, um, and that will tune the laser. Um, you can combine multiple lasers. These, this is some of my own work. We, back in the eight, late 80s, we were making uh, heterodyne receivers, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But you know, just showing that you could combine a whole bunch of different waveguides and devices and detectors and so forth. Um, this stuff actually transitioned into commercial production, so now most of the lasers you'll see in telecommunication systems, a lot of them really are tunable lasers now. That way they don't have to buy a special one for each wavelength. They just buy the laser and they tune it to the channel they need electronically. Um, it's gotten more sophisticated since then. So this shows work from a company called Infinera, founded by a bunch of friends of mine. Um, and they're a full-blown system company, so they don't sell these things to the world. But what they were able to do is take all these components for something like a wavelength division multiplex signal uh, system and shrink them down to individual chips. So this single chip would have all of this stuff on it, <coughs> you know, hundreds of components on it. And this shows some of the more most recent picks that might have uh, upwards of a thousand components on it. Um, and Coherent technology, so, you know, I, as, a, uh, as a researcher, one of my major disappointments, as a kid, I was very excited by learning about optical communications, and I was thinking, wow, you know, all the things people do with radio, you can really do that at, at the frequency of light? You know, it's 10 million times higher frequency, can you really do that? Um, that's really cool. And then when I found out, no, that's not what they did. The systems at that time were just like flashlights, people just turning them on and off really quick, blink, 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 blink. Um, so there was none of the FM modulation, no phase encoding, none of the fancy stuff. So people kind of embarked over the last few decades to change that. And today, the, this shows a complex uh, representation of the envelope field of a pulse of light. And this shows on-off keyed where it goes from zero intensity. This would be the real axis to out back and forth. That would be going from a one to a zero. But now people have QPSK, this is quadrature phase shift keying, where there's four representation, maybe even 16 QAM. So the information encoding now in optical communication systems is it's exactly the way people encode information in radio, um, except it is uh, 10 million times higher in frequency. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable. And when they receive these signals, they go into digital signal processors. So the combination of electronics and photonics is now really, really uh, pretty incredible. <coughs> this shows an example of uh, what I showed you earlier from Infinera, which is uh, a single chip that's 500 gigabits per second per chip. And this shows just one channel uh, for the uh, receiver. Here's the, the local oscillator that beats with the incoming signal. You know, those of you who are interested in this stuff, I'm happy to talk to you about it in more detail. But these are implementing all the techniques used in radio receivers since way back in the day that were not possible to do with light until we got it to the point where it was genuinely like working with the sine wave and you could do all the same things you do with, um, with uh, RF signals. And that now they're up to... Uh, devices that can uh, transmit 2.4 terabits per second out of a single chip. 
It's, it's pretty incredible. The new, new kit on the block is silicon photonics. And um, this is trying to take advantage of the silicon technology. This is already out of date, um, which allows you to put, as I said, 7 billion transistors on a single chip. You can make features that are down on the scale of nanometers very reproducibly. Um, and you can make things with that many transistors where the yield they work so well that the yield is high enough where you can still make it cheap enough to be a consumer device. So the question is, can you use this stuff to do photonics? And you know, the answer is maybe kind of, because silicon, you can make waveguides and things like that, but it's not, you can't make a laser out of silicon. Um, it doesn't have the right characteristics to give you gain. Um, but you can make modulators, it turns out, and you can make detectors using germanium, and et cetera, et cetera. So people embarked on this path and very quickly discovered they could make really reproducible optical waveguide structures that had all kinds of ring resonators, and they could make photo detectors that had fantastic performance. Um, they could make modulators that would work at you know, 50 gigabits per second and use incredibly low amounts of energy. This shows one that was, uh, this shows a view of a modulator. This is a real device where the uh, optical bus goes this way and the light gets into this modulator, but only if it's on resonance. And, and you can detune it to get an on-off signal. And it only requires femtojoule kind of energies to work. Um, so this stuff got commercialized. And people started uh, making companies. You, know, you heard about Jim Wyant making companies. So people were leaping into the field and uh, making companies. And they were very successful. They got acquired. Um, a lot of these were companies that I, I had advisory walls with, or um, it's a small community. We, everybody knows everybody in it. But these ended up being very successful and, and getting acquired for numbers on the order of you know, half a billion dollars and, and so forth. Um, and it continues now. This is you know, last year there was a company doing silicon photonic coherent receivers that, got, uh, that had a $4 billion market cap shortly after it IPO'd. Um, this is my son's advisor and a good friend out at Santa Barbara and his roommate that founded a company uh, that got acquired by, um, by Juniper doing silicon photonics. Intel is now in the game and uh, they work on some of this stuff actually close by up in, um, up in Chandler. Um, so as part of this field, we, uh, a bunch of us got together and wanted to take advantage of some of the funding that was made available in the field of optics and photonics um, for manufacturing institutes. So in the United States, they wanted to, I don't know if you're familiar in Europe, they have, Germany has these Fraunhofer institutes that are kind of R&D enterprises that help advance technology through manufacturing. And the US government wanted to do the same thing. Um, so a bunch of us proposed that they should do this in the field of photonics, and we, uh, we we, in, in particular, this integrated photonics, chip scale, silicon photonics, um, to try to improve the manufacturing capabilities in that area. And it, it was successful, so it was awarded. It's the largest institute that was awarded. It's, it has about a $600 million uh, war chest, $110 million from the federal government, and then New York State is the biggest partner, and they put in uh, $250 million. Um, so it's a, it's a great institute, and a lot of companies are participating in it at different levels. Um, so we now have projects where we work with all these companies. When I say we, I really mean this whole team of universities that we work with. This chart doesn't mean that Caltech is a tier two university. It just means the level of financial participation they have in the institute. So the, the deeply embedded players are shown here. And then there's a bunch of others that are involved as well. And the heart of this thing is a fab in uh, Albany, New York. And that's what uh, helped us win the award as we lined this capability up as part of the enterprise. And it's genuinely a state-of-the-art microfabrication for silicon. Um, they even have programs where they were working on 18-inch silicon wafers in there. They have the lithography tools I talked about that go all the way down to 7 nanometer scale. Um, and this is now available to, to make chips uh, for photonics. And um, so this is critical. And the idea here is that we wanted to provide a capability where you just today, when you want to make an integrated circuit, 
you don't go back and start with transistors and say, oh, you know, how, how did that transistor work? You start with design kits and libraries of electronic circuits that have functionality and you license them from companies that do design and you string together a circuit that has a counter and it has this and it has a logic cell and memory readouts and et cetera, et cetera. And you piece that together as a circuit designer and you send it to the fab and you get back chips and you make your products out of that. We wanted to do the same thing in photonics. So that's the goal of this program. And we've got a design library in place now that can make all kinds of stuff. I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, but it's at that point now where if you want to submit a job and you've got the money to do it, it's not cheap. It's a, it's two thousand dollars a square millimeter uh, to get a to get a circuit. But you can fit a lot on a square millimeter. The stuff is so small, um, and the idea is more uh, companies and and large research programs um, where they can afford a hundred thousand dollars to submit a job and um, and get back a whole bunch of chips to do their development. Um, so one of the other things that we're tackling as part of this institute is the, the packaging associated with integrated circuits, photonic integrated circuits. I showed you those chips from Infinera. This shows how they're actually hooked up. And those are all wire bonds. And not only are there wire bonds, there's like one, two, three, four, five layers of wire bonds on top of each other that can't touch each other. Those wires better not touch. And the only way they can get the density of electrical connectivity they want is through ridiculous means like this. And so we need to do something better. And one of the solutions to do that was using three-dimensional uh, integration. And so the idea was we could have layers of silicon circuits all on the same chip, but each layer would have a different function. One layer would have optoelectronics, the next one might have digital memory, we might have analog and so forth. And if you can fabricate each of those and then sequentially stack that up and build this chip up, you've done your packaging at a chip scale. You don't, you don't need to have all this crazy connectivity. You just need to get in and out of the chip. And um, a lot of people saw the merits of this. But it turns out you, you can develop technologies like that, but they're absurdly expensive. Um, and it's because the only way to get anything cheap is through high volume. So when you make millions or billions of a product, like cell phones, you can afford to make them inexpensively. And it's because you reuse that same infrastructure and you just keep turning the crank and you bang these things out. But if you don't make very many of them and you paid for all that stuff and you only made five of them, the cost is gonna be all that stuff divided by five. So the only way to get this stuff to really mature is to have a consumer application for some of these stacking technologies. And there, was, there wasn't anything like that. Um, and it, it reminded me of uh, this 2001 movie. I don't, you, you probably, not, none of you even ever saw this movie. Um, but, it, you know, it, it was kind of a vision of what drives uh, innovation. In Stanley Kubrick's mind, it was some kind of obelisk from outer space that would uh, enlighten these apes and cause them to... Well, you know, at OSC, we're really, really good at optics. So we did an image analysis of this to find out what the heck that thing really was. It turns out it was a cell phone. Um, and sure enough, that's, oh, I didn't know this had sound with it. Oh. Um, so the cell phone is also re-emerging, and it goes back to where's the money in microelectronics going in today. It's going into mobility. You know, it's almost like desktop computers are obsolete now. Uh, everybody's running around with tablets and cell phones and so forth. So that's what's driving the technology. And it turns out the cell phone cameras, those cameras again, uh, to get high performance, Sony came up with technology that allowed them to do this three-dimensional stacking. So this shows the image sensor layer sitting on top, and then there's an image signal processing layer down here, and they connect this together with through silicon vias, kind of micron scale features, to connect these chips vertically on top of each other. Well, that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted a commercial solution to this, and now the question was, can we map that into optics and photonics? So that's one of the things we're doing also. This shows a, a market projection from a company called YOL, which shows uh, 3D wafer stacking starts by application. And they recognized even back when this was made that photonics would be an important driver in this three-dimensional world uh, 
around the time frame that we're at now. So we're starting to offer that capability as part of this institute as well. So the exercise is kind of forget all the things you know about microelectronic packaging and redesign to take advantage of these ridiculously expensive tools that you could never afford for photonics, but because they're there for free, because they're used in electronics, you just borrow them and use them. And so this kind of technology is now going to have a huge impact on things you do in the world of photonics that we used to do with individual lasers. You know, it's like going back to, you would never go back from integrated circuits to individual transistors now, and it's going to be the same way in the world of photonics. It will be very sophisticated photonic integrated circuits. This shows an example of the three-dimensional stacking that we're actually doing in the institute um, in conjunction with uh, MIT. Um, so that, that's the uh, end of my talk. I've got about two minutes left. The message is that photonics is awesome. It's, uh, it's, it's a really a great playground where you get to use all the cool physics you learn uh, all the way from quantum field theory, quantum mechanics, Maxwell's equations, semiconductor, optoelectronics, and so forth. Um, and every once in a while, you witness those very physics-y physics things being transformed into yet another generation of real deployable technology that will change your lives. An example today is quantum information science. It used to just be a source of papers and FizzRev letters. I don't want to say just, because that's where all the good stuff is. That's where it starts. Um, but now it's moved to the point where people understand that it's real. They can develop real applications using the technology. And we will start asking, can we implement them in photonic integrated circuits to make them ubiquitous and cheap and so forth. Um, so yeah, we, we're very enthusiastic here at the college. I, if you go to our website, we have a, a video on there. Every year at graduation, mm -hmm. I tell our students, yeah, so this, so this is it's very timely because all the Star Wars movies coming out. But, you know, you may not realize that that stuff is real. We, we have some skunk works research that we have here at the college. Uh, you're going to, you signed the stuff, so it's okay. So I'll show you, this is, uh, yeah, so that, that's one of our students uh, working with the lightsabers we've got downstairs. I'll, we'll, we'll let you work with them if you want. They're, they're pretty dangerous, but... Uh, Anyway, just having fun with you. So thank you for the hour, and uh, I hope I've shared some of my own enthusiasm with photonics. Uh, it's very real. It changed your lives already with the internet uh, and all kinds of things. So good field to work in. It's not going away anytime soon. Questions? No questions. I answered it all. <laughs> okay. Well, we have uh, we have other speakers. Actually, I don't have the agenda handy. Is there a break? Okay. All right. Well, you can ask me questions out in the hall if you. Tucson, uh, and uh, thanks uh, for listening. coming this afternoon. You, if you look at your agenda, the title I have here is a little bit different, um, but I'll get to the topic that's in the title. This was my initial title, and I'm, I'm going to kind of keep going on some of the themes that uh, Dean Koch was on, and then I'll shift gears on you a little bit. So uh, I call this Optical Sciences Engine of the Information Age. And well, this is pretty much how it looks outside of optical sciences, you know, 300 days a year. <laughs> You're having you know, one of those days today. 
I like, I've lived in Tucson for 13 years. Um, I took instantly to it. I don't mind 105 degree heat. Uh, and, uh, and I love the desert. And one of my colleagues who's, who now is in Atlanta, but thinking of moving back here, he had been here for a while, and he, he called Tucson enchanting. And I thought that was the perfect word for Tucson. So I, I, I think so too. So I've been saying that ever since. Um, and there's me, if you're ever looking for me, I'm <laughs> right here on the second, second floor. When I first moved into this building, it was a little bit distracting, you know, the kids walking by, waving. And now I, I don't even notice, <laughs> so, so, but it's fun. Okay, so I'm going to start on something that, you know, you're using every day and that Dean Koch talked a lot about, which was the Internet. And in particular, more and more of the Internet is not out there going over hundreds of kilometers, it's inside something called a data center. Um, how many of you have ever seen a data center? You haven't? Okay, two of you have, good for you. How is that possible? I mean, basically the entire internet is running through these things, but yet you've never seen them. Well, you'll, you'll see why as I get through this. Um, so, so Zetabyte, so how, anybody tell me what a Zetabyte is? How many, 10, 10 to the what? 21, 10 to 21. <laughs> 10 to 21 bytes, that's what the data byte is. And you can see the current projections by Cisco. This has been very accurate. I've been updating this chart for years because Cisco knows pretty much better than anybody uh, how the internet is growing. So you have 15.3 data bytes per year by 2020. This is the inside of a data center. This is actually the inside of a Microsoft data center. Um, and here you can see data center to data center, data center to user within data center, you know, in terms of the data center um, traffic. So, so much that traffic goes on within the data center. When you do a Google search, uh, you know, that, that information is traveling among hundreds, if not thousands of servers to make it look, to, to make it as good as possible and also make it look like, you know, it takes no time. So one zettabyte, just so you can dimensionalize this, is 50 million years, 50 million years of DVD quality video. Okay, that's a lot, of, that's a lot of information. Okay, so you gotta have, so, Actually, within the data center, and this, this picture is kind of the front, the one side of these, of these servers. The other side is just bundles and bundles of optical fiber everywhere. Because the only way you can keep that communication going at those speeds is to use optical fiber. So why? Why optical fiber? Well, it's really simple. It's just bandwidth. Um, anybody in this room still use DSL to access the Internet? You know, I mean, the funny thing is that, you know, Europe and... and uh, Asia used it for quite a while because um, they never installed cable. There are no cable systems. So DSL, so they just skipped cable and went to fiber. So there's more fiber in Europe and Asia now than there are here. But you know, DSL was over a twisted pair, which has an astounding bandwidth of about 45 kilohertz. Uh, and uh, the reason, you know, 95% of you get cable, get your internet through the cable system is because it has a carrier frequency in the hundreds of megahertz. So, you know. Uh, for most people, that's good enough today, but you know, in the future, future. Now, there's a lot going on with wireless. Wireless <coughs> internet access is becoming more and more uh, useful, especially for remote areas like you go a few, you know, 10 miles outside of Tucson. You know, th those, that's becoming a viable way to access the internet because you do have wireless with 5G and other things coming on. You can get very high frequency. Um, they still have problems, but uh, it's getting to be um, more and more popular, but at the end of the day, you're always going to need optical fiber, both for distance and bandwidth, because optical fiber, you know, is, uh, you know, six orders of magnitude more than your cable in terms of its fundamental bandwidth. So optical fiber is not going anywhere, um, and, uh, you know, that's, I remember the first time I saw an optical fiber, there was a little red light coming out of this piece of glass, and I thought, well, that's, that's kind of amazing, and I've pretty much been hooked ever since. So that's been my home field since I was basically uh, a senior, just like most of you are. Um, and that was before there was an internet. But there, was a, there, was, there were lots of phone calls, but no, no, no internet. Uh, so this is a basic optical fiber network. It's very simple. Uh, it's digital communication, uh, and it's in, in one way or the other. And there's lots of flavors that have been put on top of this now. The first one was wavelength division multiplexing, then various different kinds of, of uh, ways of processing the information. But at the end of the day, you have a transmitter that's generating your signal. This is a, what's called a non-return to zero looking signal. Um, 
you have a single mode fiber that generally for the wavelengths that we use the internet at, 1310, 1550 nanometers, you can go um, 40 or 50 kilometers uh, and, and you know, even uh, a bit further uh, and, and have a reasonable chance of detecting the light on the other end. Now you can see this nice square signal has been kind of beaten up and knocked down and twisted around. That's caused by the dispersion, <coughs> excuse me, that occurs in the fiber. So dispersion is just the fact that when you make a pulse, the pulse has different frequency components. Those different frequency components move at different speeds through the fiber, and over distances of 20 to 50 kilometers, those become real effects that you can easily see. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, you can receive it at quite, uh, quite uh, low power levels. And uh, we were talking at lunch today about ways you can use quantum quantum uh, concepts to go to even lower power levels of detection. So what would that do for you? Well, you could run that fiber quite a bit further before you'd have to detect the signal. So that, that's valuable. Uh, the main reason that most people don't have optical fiber in their house is because optical fiber is very expensive to install. None of this stuff, the fiber, the transceiver, the transmitter, the receiver, that's all very cheap. It's commodity prices. You can buy them for you know, fibers, you know, pennies per meter or less. But installing the fiber isn't. So um, that's why many people don't have that yet. So how do you make those signals? One way is to directly modulate the laser. So laser, a uh, semiconductor laser, runs by applying a current to uh, a junction. Uh, you can turn that current on and off, and that works very well over uh, the Internet up to about 2 to 3 gigabits per second, which was the, the rate at which the, the, the time domain rate at which the Internet was running about 20 years ago. So, so up to 2 to 3 gigabits per second, you can directly modulate lasers. Beyond that, this dispersion of the, 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 the pulses that you can make that come out of the laser start to distort even coming out of the laser. And then when you put on top of that the fiber distor distortion, you can't do it. So, um, so you have to use external modulation. So one of the things that I've worked on most of my career are various different types of external modulators. Here in Arizona, we focused primarily on uh, electro-optic modulators. So an electro-optic modulator is, is based on materials who, when you apply an electric field to them, there are refractive index changes. So, and this was an effect that was discovered in the 19th century. You don't need lasers to discover this. You just need to apply large electric fields, and people knew how to do that in the 19th century. So uh, Pockles is actually the guy who discovered it for certain crystals. You apply that large electric field, refractive index changes, or refractive index changes, well, I can change lots of things. Uh, certainly the phase the phase that a light beam experiences in going through a medium now has changed when I apply an electric field. That fundamentally allows me to make things like lenses and also interferometers. So what these are, are little chip-based interferometers. Um, and, um, you know, uh, a classic Mach Zender interferometer on a chip looks like this. And on the chip, we have waveguides. So waveguides are uh, basically the planar version of an optical fiber. You have a signal come in here. And in the simplest case, it might have an electrode on one, one, one waveguide, not on the other. And by applying a field here, I either get you know, a pulse or nothing here, depending on whether I've applied a field to this electrode. Okay? So that's, that's how these modulators work. So they're, they're, they just turn the light on and off by applying a field. This video should work. This has worked before. <laughs> this is actually very low speed modulation I'm showing because if I showed it at you know, 10 gigabits per second, you would just look like a constant light there. So I'm just making it. And you can see the, the contrast of the modulator is, a, is an important thing. This is actually a very good modulator because it goes very dark. Um, for digital communications, you don't actually need that good a modulator. It's much better than you usually need. 10, 10 dB, which is 10 dB. Anybody tell me what 10 dB is? You think in dB units? Probably not. dB units, uh, is, that's a factor of 10. So, you know, 20 dB is a factor of 100. 30 dB is a factor of 1,000. And 5.5 uh, and dB, that's one thing we didn't like about this modulator. A little, that's about, uh, means about 20, about 30% of the light, 30 to 40% of the light is getting through the modulator. So that's an important aspect. But we've been through a lot of generations of these particular types of devices. And the reason we work with these materials is that they fundamentally can go to very, very high speeds. One of the things we do at Arizona is we take things all the way to the end. We don't just make the chip, make a measurement, and you know, publish a paper. We want to we take it to something that somebody can actually use. A chip like that, you can't actually use. You want something that fibers are attached to and coming out of. So this is showing 
this is a 40 gigahertz uh, device, so 40, 40 gigabit, it could be a 40 gigabit per second digital modulator or a 40 gigahertz analog modulator. So, um, and that's better than the internet runs now. So the time, the time, the, you know, the, the actual, the actual amount of information right now is at 100 gigabits per second, but it's chunked down to 25 gigabit per second pieces that are put onto different um, phases, basically. So this is still faster than the internet uses. Uh, optical fiber, see here we've got, we're attaching a fiber to it. That's a tough process. I didn't show my famous fiber picture, but you know, one of the problems with optical fiber is um, this is what an optical fiber looks like. Uh, this is the, the, the diameter which is about 125 microns, and all the light is here in about 10 microns. So that makes it very difficult to align optical fiber to other things because you, need, you basically need submicron precision to keep the losses down. But we've got all that solved, and here we're even uh, attaching contacts, and we have wire bonding, and here's the modulator in operation. Um, this is basically radio. So we've got a relatively narrow band light beam here. We're looking at this on an optical spectrum analyzer. And we're applying different frequencies. And when I apply, say, 30 gigahertz frequency, I get a 30 gigahertz sideband, just like I would in a radio signal. And uh, you know, 35 gigahertz, uh, 35 gigahertz sidebands. And we can look at those sidebands and then analyze the performance of the modulator. OK, I'm getting this solar energy. You'll see it's kind of. <laughs> so, um, so modulator is a very key thing for the internet. Um, another key thing that's happened recently, and this is directly because of data center photonics is um, silicon photonics. So anybody here heard of silicon photonics? So you can, actually, you can actually do photonics in silicon once you're, does anyone know where silicon stops absorbing light? Where, where does silicon absorb light to in the, in the, in the near infrared? Uh, it, it basically stops at about one micron. So below one micron, silicon is a really good detector. You know, so five, all visible light, near infrared light, it's a good detector. Beyond one micron, it's a bad detector because it doesn't absorb light. <laughs> I can't detect anything. But I can guide light in it, and I can make other sorts of devices in it. This is actually a, this is what's called a wavelength uh, division. So this is, a, this is a term that you'll see, um, dense wavelength division multiplexing, which is usually just called DWDM. And the idea is that light beams of different color do not interfere. So one of the things that made the current internet possible, in addition to extremely low loss optical fiber and those transmitters and optical amplifiers, which are, I describe as sort of this incredible gift, um, is the fact that you can take one optical fiber and turn it into 32 or 64 or 128 by sending slightly different colors down that fiber. So what we have here is a device that you put on the other end to pull out the different colors. So here comes all those colors. Oh, this guy pulls off one. Here's a way for me to put on a new signal of that same color. This guy pulls off another one, pulls off another one. And um, you can basically then you know, have all that information coming down that one fiber and, uh, and uh, take it apart with these micro rings. These, are, these rings are about 30 microns in, uh, in diameter. Uh, and uh, their actual width of the waveguides here is about half a micron. So they're quite, they're quite small. And what we did, uh, so, da so we'll see <laughs> why this is so important. Uh, silicon itself, it's, it's, its optical properties depend on temperature. Actually, all things optical properties depend on temperature uh, you know, to, to different degrees. Uh, you see that in the desert in the summertime when you see a mirage. A mirage is really caused by the fact that uh, you know, the, the air is heating up. Because the air is heating up, you have this gradient of the temperature, which causes a different refractive index uh, in, in, in here as opposed to here, and that creates a lensing effect, which creates a mirage. In this case, the, the, the temperature-dependent refractive index of silicon actually changes the wavelength that comes out of these filters as I change the temperature. Um, that's not a big deal if I can control the temperature. I'll you know, just put it on a heater or something. Problem is, if you're going to use this as a data center, as we'll see in a minute, the last thing you want to do is put more energy inside of a data center. Okay? It's the last thing you want to do. So you want to have a way to use these things where you don't have to control their temperature. So we came up with a way to do that, uh, which involves putting a different material on top of the silicon here to uh, make uh, essentially the device be temperature independent. So ordinary devices 
they would move by 10 nanometers over this range of 80 degrees, and our device doesn't move at all. So that was a nice development and got rid of the need for temperature control. But this whole integration thing is really very important. You know, and this is a little bit off my overall theme, but I just want to point out the power of this. So this is what an optical network node looks like today with discrete devices that are optical fibers and cables and things like that and boxes. And you can see all these boxes and cables and stuff cabled together. And here's you know, more optical fiber cable over here. And you know, it's just a mess. Uh, if you are smart and, can, and, and know what you're doing with integrated optics, you can take all that and turn it into something that's a half millimeter by a 1.3 millimeter chip. So you can essentially get rid of all of those connections, all of those wires are all gone. They're all on the chip. And basically, this chip has practically all the functionality of that previous uh, mess of stuff. Okay? So that's really the power of integration as we're looking to go. Uh, one caveat is that uh, optical integration, and th this has been true. And there, there are, there are, there's a lot of effort to, to change the game here. One, one, one approach is plasmonics. But generally, uh, optic, optical integration has been, has been limited to length scales on the order of a micron, whereas electronic integration is already at length scales of 10 nanometers. Uh, why is that? Well, because the electron fundamentally has a wavelength that's much shorter than the, when, than the photon. So when you look at it from that point of view, how can you ever get photonics down to that level? Well, one way is using plasmonics, and you know, that, that's a separate research area that we've pursued, but uh, it's still heavy going. So, we're probably never going to see, at least not in my lifetime, maybe in your lifetime, uh, photonic integration at the density of electronic integration. But there are other reasons to do it, as we just saw. OK, what does this all have to do with solar energy? So, uh, well, those data centers I talked about, um, they're growing quite rapidly. So this is what a data center looks like. Uh, and you can see you know, these are cars. <laughs> um, and uh, that's a big field. And if you go to Quincy, Washington, which is where this one is, which is in the middle of nowhere in Washington State, you will see 10 of these, OK? Uh, different companies, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, they're all there. Why? Well, one reason is the energy is cheap in Washington, because you have really cheap hydrothermal, hydro, hydro, hydropower from the, uh, from the Columbia River. Okay, so you can, get, you can get lots of energy that way. This is what it looks like inside. This is what it looks like outside. I first saw a data center eight years ago uh, in Phoenix. And you might say, well, gee, why did you put a data center in Phoenix? It's hot. Um, there, there are actually good reasons to do it. Um, but I went there, and I didn't know what to expect. And um, I grew up in a town called Easton, Pennsylvania, which is an old steel country. And you know, I'd seen steel mills when I was a kid. And uh, I looked outside this thing. And you know, there's all this steam coming out. And there's these huge water cooling pipes. And it looked like they were making steel inside. <laughs> but they weren't. They just had a whole bunch of computers that were generating incredible amounts of energy. Uh, and they needed to cool them to keep them going. Um, so, so how serious is this issue of you know, data center energy use? Well, this is, tells you. Data centers now consume 10% of the business electricity in the United States. So in the United States, you know, consider all the uses of electricity for business, 10% of that is consumed by data centers. At the current growth rates, data centers would use all the electricity currently used in the United States by the year 2040. That's only 25 years from now. All the electricity took everything, and business electricity use is only 25% of the total electricity used in the United States. So at the current growth rates, they'll use it all. <laughs> there won't be any electricity that will have to install all kinds of new electricity. Obviously, that's a problem. Um, and you can see why you don't know about this, right? <laughs> because that's not a, something that these guys want you to know about. But they are trying to fix it. So how? Um, data centers need renewable energy. And most of the companies that are in this space are very committed to, uh, to renewable energy. Some of them already have data centers that are completely run by renewable sources. Apple has a few. Um, Microsoft, for a while, has been offsetting any new data center construction they do with renewable uh, construction elsewhere, not actually powering the data center with, with renewables, but uh, offsetting what they're doing on the one hand with uh, goodness on the other hand. So we actually have two solar energy programs that have been um, working towards helping this problem. And uh, the two here are um, this one, which is what's called a hybrid 
uh, a hybrid CSP CPV system, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. And this is actually a prototype that's set up about 15 minutes west of here. Uh, it's operating and collecting data. Um, it's about five meters this way by eight meters that way. And uh, the, I'll, I'll explain the rest of what's in it in a second. But uh, you've got a, a thermal bus here which collects thermal energy. You've got a mirror here which actually directs some of the light down to high efficiency photocells, uh, which are uh, actually much more efficient than silicon. Uh, another what, what thing, so this is a way, and we'll see you know, the, the motivation behind this in a second, is to have a better uh, provisionable solar energy. This program, <coughs> called Mosaic, here we're actually trying to make more efficient panels. So here, you know, we're, we're not making panels. Here we're trying to make more efficient panels, basically 30% efficient. Typical silicon efficiency right now is 22 or 23 percent, so be more than 30 percent efficient by combining an underlying silicon panel, which collects diffuse sunlight, with uh, micro, very small micro-sized uh, cells. Let me get my arrow here. Um, eh, where is it? Um, down here that actually um, work at very high concentrations and are about 40 to 45 percent efficient. Okay, so. Uh, there's, there's, there's actually a lot of interest in this one because you can do other things with the heat other than generating electricity, and I'll say a little bit about that. And why this one? Uh, go back to that data center. One of the problems with solar energy is uh, I, I visited a data center. I can't actually tell you much about it because of an agreement I signed. But the, if, you, if you took one section of one of those buildings we saw, if you, if you put solar panel, silicon solar panel on top of the entire data center that we saw, you could power one small section of one of those buildings. That's it. You know, the sun's just not bright enough. I mean, it's good for life, but it's bad if you really want to have efficient solar energy. Right? So, uh, so it just takes a lot of area. So the idea is, hey, if I can do 30% more effi efficient, that's 50% more efficient, I can cut that area down. Okay. So... So this is one of the uh, things that, that actually motivated the uh, work on this hybrid system. And it's called the duck curve. So if you look at energy consumption, if you look at the every day, so here's, here's midnight, here's 3 a.m. Um, this is March 31st. I think this is in California somewhere. Um, 4 a.m., the consumption, and this is, look at 2012 or 2013. These different years, as this thing goes down, it's showing increased usage of renewable energy in California, which was mandated in California. Okay, so it's predictable. You know this is going to happen. Okay. Um, so 2012, you can see what happens. You know, about four, around 4 o'clock, you start getting this ramp up. People will get up. Everybody's getting up, going to work. You use energy. Middle of the day, there's a little bit of a dip. Not too much. And then at the end of the day, there's a big ramp up. At the end of the day, people come home. Now, the ramp up's not that bad in 2012 because there wasn't that much renewable in place. Now look at, look at 2014, 2015. What's happening here is because you've got all the renewable deployed, the grid actually doesn't need to provide as much. So you have a dip in the middle of the day. You have the sun. The sun's creating all this energy. So I've got a dip in, you know, in energy consumption from the grid because I'm creating all this energy with renewables. Guess what? What happens? At the end of the day, I've got to ramp this thing up huge now. I don't have to just give it a little tweak. I've got to ramp it up 13 gigawatts in three hours because I've got all this stuff that's using renewable, which can't be stored efficiently. Okay, so this is a so-called duck curve. And you reach a point where you're actually generating, you reach an over-generation point, where you're generating more electricity than you're actually using. You know what happens then? What do you think happens in a, in a market where you've got a huge supply and no demand? The price drops like a rock. In fact, you have to pay people to take the electricity, which is what Germany does in the summertime, because Germany way over-deployed solar technology. So in June in Germany, they have to pay France and Switzerland to take their energy, because they don't know what else to do with it. <laughs> they have no way to dissipate it, okay? So this program, the whole motivation of this program was to avoid that problem. And the way you avoid it is by having a cheap way to, sol to store solar energy through the night. So you don't have these big ramps, so that you basically can can, can, can smooth it out. And that's what this technology can do for you. So basically, you've got the photocells here. That's the thing that's causing those big ramps because you can't store it efficiently, efficiently yet. Someday, maybe batteries will be cheap enough for that to happen, but it's not here yet. And you've also got this concentrated solar 
power, which is basically heat. You're taking the solar energy and you're turning it into heat. Now, when you turn something into heat, well, it's just like I'd have natural gas or oil or any other way I could make heat. Now I've got heat. I can, I can make steam and drive turbines, and I can store it. And I can turn it into electricity you know, in, you know, in that way, too. And I can store it um, by phase, so this is thermodynamics, uh, by a phase transition. So basically, I store it in latent heat. I have some, things called molten salts because uh, you, want a, you want a very efficient Carnot engine here. And the, you know, basically, the, the bigger temperature you can get to, the more efficient your Carnot engine. So typically, these systems run at three or 400 degrees C. And they have salts that are sitting there that basically melt at those temperatures. And you basically store the energy uh, when you melt and then you get it back out again. So it's a, it's a latent heat, uh, a latent heat uh, storage. And that lasts for about 14 hours. And that, we put these two, two together for our hybrid collector. This is how the optics work. Again, you create direct electricity, electricity from these high efficiency photocells which are down here. Light comes in, bounces off this gigantic parabolic reflector. Light, <coughs> light gets redirected to this hyperbolic secondary. So this is basically a telescope. It's a cathode grain telescope. Um, when we first came up with this, we thought, you know, how is this going to work? And you know, it, 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 it actually does work, but it was we were, we we. Uh, we, we really looked at it hard before we went for it. So we, we, we split out a piece of the spectrum that goes down to the photocell. Roughly right now from about 500 to 850 nanometers, we started a little bit blue of that. It gets directly turned to electricity. Then some of the light goes through to this tube, just gets absorbed. That's mostly the infrared light. I'll show you the spectrum looks like in a minute. And then that just turns into heat. So we create heat that can be directly converted to electricity, stored for later conversion, or used directly as heat. What we're finding is a lot of people have a use for it directly as heat. And uh, when you put these together, direct PV electrical efficiency plus thermal energy converted to electricity, that's called exergy. Okay, so exergy is uh, a combined electricity directly from PV and the electricity that you could get from that thermal energy. That's called the exergy. And, and again, that part of it is a part of it that you can send out at any time. You don't have to use it right away because you can store it. So you can smooth out the duct curve. Another way of looking at it, this is actually one of our early spectral splitting mirrors. That's the key technology here, is that curved dichroic. Uh, we have a proprietary way of making that that we actually are not talking about yet um, because we're trying to you know, complete our patent coverage on it. But the... Um, you basically split out this piece for the photovoltaic. That goes down to, the, uh, to those cells. As I said, we started a little bit blue of where we wound up. And then the rest of it goes through to the thermal tube. So all of this infrared. And you can see sunlight goes out to about 2.5 microns. So it, it does uh, run out quite a ways. And we can store it for about 14 hours, so, which is you know, long enough uh, for, uh, uh, for, most, for most times of the year. <coughs> This is actual alignment of the system. Uh, you know, we have a, a laser array there. Uh, these are actually concentrating optical units. So there's, there's three levels of concentration here. The big parabolic trough focuses. The hyperbolic mirror focuses again. And at the end, we have Fresnel lenses and funnels going down to those uh, concentrated uh, uh, solar cells, which are actually quite small system tracks the sun automatically. Um, you don't really understand how, how much the sun moves until you do something like this. <laughs> it moves a lot. And uh, you've, got to stay with, you've got to stay with it in this system to within about half a degree. So, you, so basically, you've got about half a degree of tolerance, and you're following the sun. This system actually fo follows the sun east-west, which is how we usually think of following the sun. And then it also has a built-in north-south tracking as well for time of year changes, because as the time of year changes, of course, the sun goes from being more in the north to more in the south, and uh, that changes how the rays come into the system. This is a single segment. There's, there's a system like this deployed uh, at uh, Gila Bend, uh, you know, a, cl a classic parabolic trough that doesn't have our improvements, that doesn't have the photovoltaic part, so just the heat, that has 900,000 of these. So practically a million of these mirrors uh, in one place. That generates about a gigawatt. Okay. So just to go back to the data center thing, we're talking about gigawatt data centers uh, today. Do you know how much, how much energy do you think, how much power do you think uh, Arizona uses in 
August, when everybody's got their air conditioners going. How much electricity? Any guesses? How 15 gigawatts? Entire state. <laughs> you know? And you're talking about data centers using one gigawatt. So that that's gives you another feeling on that. Another, 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 another thing we recently calculated, because I've, I've got some ongoing research in large, a larger project in data centers. Um, the current chips that are used in data centers, the energy density in the chip is about half that in a nuclear reactor. <laughs> okay, that's, that's how hot it is in there. Okay, so think about that. Uh, this is our this is our prototype again. Uh, we're taking data now. We've got uh, we probably call it the alpha prototype because they're going to improve it. Uh, I have a one retrofit we're going to do in the next couple months. And uh, then you know we have the other system, and I think I'm on track time wise. Uh, maybe a little bit off. Uh, so the other system is to improve the um, improve the efficiency of a panel. So usually we just think about the sun coming down, but the sun. You know, especially in, well, in Tucson, we have a lot of what's called DNI, which is direct normal irradiance, you know, literally just sunlight. In places like Seattle, you have a lot more diffuse. Uh, basically, diffuse and diffuse is quantified uh, in two different ways, horizontal radiance and global horizontal r r radiance. But it's, it's not like it's coming directly from the sun. It's getting scattered off the clouds, it's getting scattered off the sky. Uh, and it's complicated to actually uh, analyze that. We'll see a little bit of work we're doing there in a minute. Uh, and, and you've also got reflectance on the surface, so it'd be nice to collect some of that too. So the whole idea of this project is let's collect as much of the sunlight as we can, the direct and the diffuse. So uh, the, the acronym here is MOSAIC. Um, I won't you know, go into where that comes from, but basically it's micro-optical. And our, our system's got uh, an acylindrical lens array which focuses at DNI light. The, well, the thing about the diffuse light is you can't focus it. It's kind of everywhere. So optics don't really work for it. Uh, you just kind of want it to go through to this underlying silicon. And you concentrate the light in two dimensions, one with these lenses and then another with waveguides. Now, these are waveguides that aren't like the waveguides I talked about over there, which are very small. These are more like light pipes. These are more kind of the things you see at a carnival in the summertime, you know, uh, with you know, fiber optics and, and, and LEDs and, and, and that kind of thing. But they have to be very efficient at getting the light from the input to the output to get to the very tiny, these are about 0.7 by 0.7 millimeter um, photocells that we have. And we also have the silicon here, and the silicon actually can detect the light on both sides. So that's for the light that's reflected. So if light gets, comes down to the ground and gets reflected, we can, we can collect that in the silicon as well. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because there's too much on it, uh, but... but the overall efficiency goal, 30%, uh, and uh, you know, we're trying to get the light through the entire system at 85% optical efficiency. This is, this is actually how the, the, the microcells are laid out. They're, they're laid out with something called a pick-and-place machine. Um, these are actually triple junction cells, so they're, they're, they're detecting from 350 nanometers out to 1,400 nanometers. Uh, because we don't have any thermal here. We want to get as much of the solar spectrum by PV as possible. And uh, uh, my student Liliana Ruiz Diaz, who will be running the uh, lab that you know, those of you who signed up for the for the immersion lab uh, in solar, which quite a few of you did actually, um, that's going to be on Monday, and Liliana will be running that. And she's done some very nice work on modeling the diffuse sky, which is really kind of um, not there has not seen a lot of uh, work. So she actually has taken the the standard models, uh, and and there's about 20, at least 20 different types of skies that are within this standard model. And she's got it working together with Light Tools, which is one of our ray tracing programs, and, uh, and MATLAB, so that we can simulate any sky. And uh, so these are different sky types, uniform illuminance, partly cloudy. There you can see the sun, uh, clear sky with the sun. Uh, this is Tucson at solar noon on May 15th you know, uh, for... for uh, a classic uh, sky model. Uh, one of the things you'll see in that la lab is characterizing lenses. Uh, we've ha worked with both uh, glass and plastic optics for this program. Plastic has advantages because it's lighter you know, um, and cheaper. 
uh, low cost. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I teach my students to say low cost because you know cheap implies it doesn't. That it's flimsy. It doesn't necessarily have to be flimsy, but it is low cost. Um, you'll see two kinds of lenses. I think she's going to show you both Fresnel and cylindrical lenses. We've picked the cylindrical lenses for a number of reasons, and we characterize them uh, like that. We do ray tracing types of, and ray tracing is actually quite complicated uh, because there's lots of rays you have to keep track of, and uh, and uh, you need very you need pretty powerful software and approaches to do ray tra tracing efficiently. Efficiently, this is using light tools, which does non-sequential ray tracing uh, very well. We design those waveguides, then we have them made. These are being made in glass. This one actually has what's called a CPC shape, uh, a, a parabolic concentrator, and uh, then we characterize them. So you'll see some of that in the in the in the immersion lab as well. And um, this is actually the setup for characterizing a little better view of it. We've got a laser beam that we blow up. We put it through a rectangular aperture. We focus it with a cylindrical lens array uh, onto, onto one edge of the waveguide. And then we look at the light coming out of the other, of the other edge, which is this bright spot here. Right? And you can see the waveguide's pretty good. So the way you can tell a good waveguide is you can't see any light. <laughs> because if you see light, it's not a good waveguide. It's going to coming out, right? It's not guiding, right? So, so the, the actual waveguide part of this, you can see not much coming up the top, but a little bit on the side here. And then, but you do see a lot of light here. So that's actually the area, the, these two areas, the areas we're focusing on the most right now, is we're, we're losing too much light on the in-coupling and on the out-coupling. So we've got various approaches we're taking to, um, to reduce that loss because it's, it's keeping us from getting to our, to our goal. Uh, and you can see, again, here, uh, again, you don't see much along the waveguide. You see light going in, you see light coming out. Okay, last thing. Uh, so that, so solar energy is extremely important for the internet because the internet is using energy like nothing we've ever created. And, and if it keeps growing the way it is, uh, you know, we're going to be in trouble in about 10 years. Um, the other thing that, you know, isn't even included in some of these projections is Internet of Things. So the most obvious Internet of Things thing, thing that you have heard about are self-driving cars. Right? Self-driving cars, they have liar chips, they're looking at other cars. Some, you know, some, so that data's got to have to go somewhere. Well, what it goes to is a data center somewhere that calculates all the car's positions and sends it back out again. And you know, the thing that's driven the use of, so how many of you, how many of you use Netflix? Yeah, see, that's what's driven the, the internet for the last eight years is video. Now, video is really simple use of a network because it's mostly just like broadcast. It's like watching TV. It's all coming down to you, okay? So that's pretty easy to manage. Not when I've got a million cars in a metropolitan area, each generating information. That's got to go up somewhere and then come back, okay? And that's going to cause all kinds of trouble in terms of how we, we deal with the Internet. So this Internet of Things has got some goodness and some badness. But, you know, we, have a, we have a position in the Internet of Things because we've come up with a cheap, pla low-cost plastic that um, low-cost plastic that is transparent in the in the infrared sensing region of uh, you know uh, you know the three microns and beyond, and uh, that's where a lot of infrared uh, equipment and cameras work, and uh, it is really low-cost because it's based on sulfur. Again, this is a a car <laughs> or something. It is a road. These are this, these are made from. Uh, from oil refining. When you refine oil, you, you create ton, literally tons and tons of sulfur. S sulfur costs about $60 a ton. That's what it costs. It's not actually as cheap as dirt, because the sulfur industry complained when we first came out with this paper. And it was like, no, you don't want to make sulfur sound cheap. You know, so, uh, so, so we actually did the calculation. Dirt's about $40 a ton. So sulfur's not as cheap as dirt, $60 a ton, but it's still pretty cheap. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, beauty of this is it's, it's, a, it's a plastic. This should, so plexiglass is polymethylmethacrylate. Uh, if you, the two optical plastics you usually see are plexiglass or polycarbonate. And um, this is plexiglass in a three to five micron camera. This and this is a student who was one of the key students on this project. Kind of see his outline there. This is through our material, same thickness, everything the same. So you can see right through it, as opposed to you can't see anything. Um, anybody know why I can't? Anybody know why I can't get infrared light through most plastics? <coughs> what what absorbs light in the infrared? 
when you're in the infrared, what's the, you know, what's the major, what's the major, major uh, source of absorption? Spectroscopy. Uh, so so it, it should, it, it, the major source of absorption is vibrations. And, um, <coughs> vi and plastics all have carbon-hydrogen bonds. And vibrations, so um, frequency of a spring, right? What's that equal? You guys are physics students. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so, so M, okay, if M's small, omega is big. Okay. Hydrogen has the smallest M there is. Okay. And uh, the reduced mass of this system is basically hard hydrogen because carbon is way heavier than hydrogen. So it's the reduced mass that goes in here. So the frequencies of infrared vibrations in plastics or anything that involves hydrogen are high. They're very high. So they go into, they practically go into the visible, okay? And they easily go into this sort of two to three micron region. Whereas once I put sulfur in, well, now I've got sulfur. Sulfur is very heavy. Sulfur, sulfur bonds, that reduced mass is way out there. So I'm pushing those frequencies much lower. They're away from where the absorption is, and, you know, voila. So that's, uh, that's the, basically the key. All of infrared optics is basically right here. <laughs> if you look at all the things that people use for infrared optics, they're all zinc selenide, you know, uh, chalcogenide, you know, germanium. They're all heavy things because of that. It's as simple as that. So, okay, so I will stop there and uh, thank you for your attention today. <laughs> and any questions? I'd be happy to field. Yes? It's basically a, it's a, it is a tiny core in a massive clouding. So this is where all the light is, okay. right? And basically, uh, so why? Why does it look this way? Um, one reason is that the, the, the index differences that are achieved in, in, uh, in standard optical fiber are pretty small. They're only about half a percent, you know? So, so, um, so I can make, so the good news is I can make the core, the core can actually be made pretty big. This is pretty big compared to some systems in terms of that. I want to make the core big because the bigger I make it, the easier it is to connect the things, right? So I want the core to be big, um, but I also have something that's made of glass. And so if I make, if I make the whole thing too thin, it's going to really be fragile and break very easily. So this, this distance is not there just to keep, there is a little bit of light that will get out They'll keep coming out of the evanescent field. But it's pretty much gone. It's well gone by 125 microns. But more importantly, for mechanical reasons, you know, this was chosen. It's actually amazing when you consider the amount of optical fibers made. Um, you know, the concentricity of this, you have 125 microns. The concentricity of this core with the outer uh, fiber is practically perfect. I mean, it's within a tenth of a micron. You know, they spec it to about 10 times that. But if you actually measure it, try and, you know, look at concentricity errors, it's, it's very good. But this, this is the standard optical fiber. You know? And um, this is one of the reasons uh, that uh, silicon photonics and other, other kind of waveguide-based technologies are, are of interest in a data center because this 125 microns is kind of a pain. I mean, if you think about packing things tightly, 125 microns is a pretty, it's basically the width of your hair. And if I'm thinking about electronic packaging, that's way wider than electronic packaging is, is generally done today. That's, that's five mils. I mean, electronic packaging was at, you know, a couple mils 20 years ago. You know, so, so you're limited, even though the bandwidth is much higher you know, of your connection, you're limited in the density. So one of the things driving integration and waveguide uses is you can, because you, have, you can have higher index contrast and also maybe you're using materials that aren't as fragile, you can, you can pack things much denser. So, yeah, very good question. Yeah. Other? All right. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I'm um, the last talk of the day, and hopefully this won't go too long so you guys don't get too overloaded with too much information. Um, I'm an assistant professor here. My name's Ewan McLeod. I've been here for a couple years. And my lab is Soft Nanophotonic Systems Laboratory. But I'm going to today give you a kind of a more general introduction about nanophotonics. I'm going to start out with kind of a, a general overview of the field, 
I'm probably not going to go into too much depth, but to, the main idea is to try to give you a flavor of the different sorts of applications, different sorts of things people are working on in terms of research uh, for nanophotonics for right now. And then at the end of the talk, I'll say a little bit about what we're actually doing in my lab in terms of research. Uh, so my lab will have a lab tour tomorrow from 1 to 3 um, p.m. in the afternoon, and then I'm also doing an immersion day lab on Monday. The immersion day lab is, uh, I think it's listed as the senior teaching lab, but it's actually going to be using an acoustic modulator to modulate um, kind of video signals. So a little bit like what Bob Norwood was talking about before, where you have, in his case, he showed an electro-optic modulator where you can turn an on and off a laser beam at high speed. You can do a similar sort of thing using actually acoustics, using sound waves to essentially control a laser beam. And that's what we'll be looking at in that immersion lab. So nanophotonics is the interaction of light with nanoscale objects or nanoscale features on objects. And it's particularly interesting because the nano objects are on the same or smaller length scale as the wavelength of visible light. And so what makes this interesting is that the typical assumptions of geometric optics and or diffractive optics do not apply. So normally when people first learn about optics in high school or you know, in early undergrad classes, you learn about ray tracing through a lens. So that's one of the first kind of examples. So when you get to the nanoscale regime, light does not travel in rays. Um, even before then in the microscale regime, you start to have to think of light as a wave. But we're kind of even beyond thinking of light as a wave, and it's even smaller than that. And so these typical sort of assumptions don't apply. And so the physics becomes a little bit different. It becomes a little bit more like electromagnetics or electrodynamics. So why learn about nanophotonics? So it's a fairly hot area of research. There are a lot of opportunities for undergraduate and graduate students who are interested in doing research. Uh, there are several major application domains, including microscopy. Um, and so some, one of the major goals here is to be able to image smaller and smaller objects and particles, so imaging subcellular particles and viruses. Uh, biosensing, using optical sensors to identify or quantify disease biomarkers. Um, plasmonics and photonic metamaterials uh, is essentially photonic devices with exotic optical properties. Computing using light, so Bob Norwood talked a little bit about that in the last talk. Nanomaterial processing and then nanomaterial characterization. So this is kind of an outline, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of, of yeah, each of these different areas. So if you're trying to do subcellular imaging, uh, what's the problem with, with microscopy, with the difficulty? So the main difficulty is you have this diffraction limit, that if you're trying to use a lens to focus down light, you can't focus smaller than lambda over 2 than about half the wavelength. So the diffraction limit for lens is lambda over twice the numerical aperture, but it's essentially the highest numerical apertures you can get out of lenses are about 1.4, um, and that's with oil immersion. So it's, a, it's about lambda over 2, maybe a little bit better um, than that. So if we want to see small things, so viruses, the size scale of viruses are kind of 200 nanometers to about 20 nanometers, that sort of range. And so that's typically smaller than this lambda over 2 limit. So if you're thinking of uh, visible light, visible light is a um, goes from kind of blue at 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers at the edge of the red. So lambda over 2 for blue light is about 200 nanometers. So anything smaller than about 200 nanometers, that's really where people start to talk about nanophotonics. And that's that size scale. So if you're wanting to look at subcellular processes, things like how do viruses infect cells, how does endocytosis work? So endocytosis is where a cell kind of ingests um, some sort of external nanoparticle. If you're trying to look at these dynamics, you need some sort of microscopy that essentially has better um, better resolution than a standard microscope can achieve. Uh, and so there are a whole bunch of other questions that you can, um, you can think of asking here. What makes cancer cells different from normal cells? So a lot of cases this has to do with things like the skeleton of the cell, and so that's what's being imaged here. Um, and so one thing that's different about cancer cells versus normal cells is the stiffness of the cell, and that has to do with the, the kind of intracellular skeleton. Things like how do cells communicate? So a lot of this is done through chemical transmitters. So you can think of like neurons transmitting signals across the synapse. That's some sort of chemical that's being released. How does that happen? How does the machinery inside of a cell function? How do cells move? And so there's been kind of a lot of developments recently. And so one of the more interesting things here is that the, the 2014 Nobel Prizes in Chemistry they had to do with essentially the super resolution imaging, being able to image these structures on a, on, a, um, on a nanophotonic regime, nanophotonic size scale. And so this is a comparison of using three different types of microscopy um, to essentially image uh, with better and better resolution. So this TERF, TERF stands for Total Internal Reflection Fluorescence. You can think of this as essentially a diffraction limited microscopy. Um, this total internal reflection helps you improve the contrast. So the blacks look particularly black compared to what you see here. So it helps improve the contrast, but the resolution is still diffraction limited. 
The second column here is something um, called uh, structured illumination microscopy, or SIM. And so this, again, is it's a little bit better than diffraction limited. You can do about a factor of two better than diffraction limited, but it's a technique of kind of projecting special patterns on, and you can see an improvement here. And then this is something called structured illumination microscopy plus photo switching. So photo switching was really the source of these 2014 Nobel Prizes in chemistry. And so you can see that you get a lot more information about the cell, about the actual skeleton of the cell here, by using some of these nanophotonic approaches to see be essentially beyond the diffraction limit to be able to see with much higher resolution um, the dynamics inside of a single cell. <clears throat> so this 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was split between um, three people, uh, and two of these, essentially Eric Betzig and William Murner, had to do with um, the super resolution, sorry, Eric Betzig and Stefan Hell had to do with these super resolution imaging approaches. William Murner, his part was being able to essentially have the, a good enough signal to noise to detect a um, kind of a single fluorescent molecule. So the way this, um, so one of these approaches has to do with this photo switching and localization. And so this is essentially that last column where you got that best resolution. The way this works uh, is somehow you need to be able to detect the difference between three fluorescent molecules. So let's assume you have three molecules. They're very closely spaced. They're much smaller than lambda over two. So this scale bar might be lambda over two. If you have conventional diffraction limited imaging, this is going to, diffraction is going to cause these three mo molecules to blur together, and you're just going to see one large blurry spot. In photo switching and localization microscopy, what happens is people use a combination of chemistry and pulses of light to essentially randomly activate individual fluorophores and then capture multiple images. So what you need is you need some way to essentially turn on one fluorophore at a time. Um, you can't specifically target a specific fluorophore, but you can do something that's sort of random, that you essentially set it up so that randomly I'm going to only excite 1% of the fluorophores, and the other 99% are in a dark state, and I'm going to capture an image. And so in that case, you're going to say, for example, capture this fluorophore on the right. You're going to see a big diffraction limited spot from that, but you've only excited one. Then you might try to repeat the process. Maybe none of these excite. You basically see nothing. The third time you repeat the process randomly, another one of these fluorophores is going to become activated. You might see this spot. Eventually, you're going to see all each one of these fluorophores activated by itself. Then what you do is you accurately find the centroids of the diffraction limited spots. So although these diffraction limited spots are pretty large, they're on the order of lambda over two, you can very accurately find the center of each one of those spots. And then you can just capture these centroids and plot and overlay just the centroids. So you can kind of think of this as there's some chemistry and there's some random switching going on and then there's some computational aspect at the end that kind of puts this all together. And so this is kind of the basis of one of those, um, one of those super resolution uh, Nobel Prizes. So beyond imaging, so one way of trying to do this uh, detection and, and biosensing and trying to image you know, small cells is you can also try to detect the objects without directly imaging them. And when you talk about this, this is generally the word people use is biosensing. And so biosensing is typically used for diagnostic or counting purposes. So again, you can imagine trying to do things like uh, count the number of viruses in the bloodstream. Uh, you can do things like trying to make cancer diagnosis by looking at biomarkers. Uh, you can have protein biomarkers. You can have DNA biomarkers. In a lot of cases, this can be accomplished with macroscale photonics, for example, a spectrometer and some sort of fluorescent labeling. But nanophotonics has been shown to provide much greater sensitivity. Uh, so viruses and bacteria, that size scale is about, uh, as I said, 20 nanometers to 200 nanometers. Proteins, the size scale is usually below 10 nanometers in diameter. Um, and then DNA or RNA, the, the kind of size of a single base pair is sub-nanometer in this case um, for DNA or RNA. <coughs> okay, so what are the different nanophotonic approaches for being able to do this biosensing? So I've shown four here, um, localized surface plasmon resonance, surface plasmon polariton uh, resonance. So I'm really only going to talk about these first two. Um, tomorrow, uh, Professor Judith, Judith Sue is going to talk about microtoroid optical resonators, which is another approach here. Most of these nanophotonic approaches for biosensing rely on tracking resonances. So the idea is you have some system that has some sort of resonant frequency. When a molecule binds to it that you're trying to detect, that resonant frequency changes. And that, the source of that resonance is different in each one of these cases. In this case, you have um, this you can think of acting like a spring mass system. Um, here, there's a resonance for coupling to the surface plasmon. Here, this is some sort of cavity, again, with a resonance. This also has a resonance. So a lot of these have resonances. So the first one of these approaches is, has to do with something called localized surface plasmon resonance. The reason for the word localized is we have just a single nanoparticle and a surface plasmon here. A plasmon is a collective oscillation of electrons. 
So you can imagine that we have a lump of a metal here, and this metal is a conductor, so it's got all the nuclei, but then it also has all the electrons that are associated with the nuclei. And those electrons are typically called free electrons because they're not bound to a single nucleus. So if you think of an atom by itself, usually that atom has all its electrons are associated with its nucleus, but in a metal, what's different is all the nuclei of the metal share all the electrons. So you have this free electron gas or this cloud of electrons that basically can oscillate along the nanoparticle. And so the idea is if you come in with light, um, this light is an electromagnetic field. And the oscillating electromagnetic field now starts to exert a force on these electrons. And these electrons start moving up and down like a spring mass system. And the restoring force here is the Coulomb attraction to the nuclei. So like any spring mass system, you have a resonance. So Bob Norwood had this equation here too. So now again, you have some sort of spring mass system. This restoring force, the K, is this Coulomb attraction to the atomic nuclei. And the mass, in this case, is the mass of the electron. <coughs> so the way it, um, it turns out is that if you have gold and silver nanoparticles, this resonant frequency, so this omega that you get here, is in the visible part of the spectrum. And so this is the source of things like stained glass windows. So the reason why stained glass windows have the color they do is they have small little metal nanoparticles in them. Um, and the size and shape of those nanoparticles essentially imparts a certain color. So what makes this useful for biological sensing is that the pre precise resonance depends sensitively on the material surrounding the particle. So let's say you have one of these small little gold nanorods. So to give you a size of dimension, the kind of length of this might be on the order of 100 nanometers. The diameter might be on the order of 10 nanometers. So it's kind of a, that, that sort of rod. And you have some sort of natural resonant frequency, um, which is going to kind of give some color. So if you shine light on this nanoparticle, you're going to see it um, kind of scatter uh, a particular type of color. But now when something binds to it, so let's say that you have this nanoparticle, it's somehow you've coated it with these purple antibodies. These purple antibodies are now designed to bind these green antibodies. So you can think of this as kind of like a secondary antibody. Um, when this happens, now the surrounding environment of this nanorod has changed. And that's going to change essentially this resonant frequency. So you can imagine that you have these electrons that are bouncing up and down, but now you've started to add like a different material with a different optical properties, and that's going to change the resonant frequency. And by looking at these changes in resonance frequency, you can start to detect when these molecules attach. So you can use this as a sensor. So you have the nanoparticle sitting here with the purple antibodies. And this just has one particular spectral signature. But now as soon as your target, which are these green molecules, attach, that spectral signature changes. So that was something called localized surface plasmons. Uh, there's another type of plasmonics, which are called surface plasmon polaritons or traveling surface plasmons. And so what makes it different here is, again, we're going to deal with a metal. So in this case, we're going to have a gold film. But rather than this electron oscillation being confined to this really small particle, this film here um, is, can be fairly large on the order of you know, you know, um, centimeters or something. And you can have essentially light waves travel along the surface of this metal. So in this case, we have light that's traveling along the surface of a metal, which is kind of very counterintuitive. Normally, you think of light as traveling through things. So light travels through air, light travels through glass. But you can actually end up with a situation where the light is confined to the surface. So normally, you have light, even if you think of light in a waveguide, it's still confined. But that light is kind of bouncing back and forth with total internal reflection. Here, what's going on is the light is actually confined to the surface or the interface between the metal and the dielectric. And if you start with Maxwell's equations, you can kind of derive the conditions where this occurs. And it turns out that there is kind of one specific set of conditions for this to happen. So if you think of this experimental system, you have a laser beam coming in. It's going to hit, say, a gold film, gold or silver film, and then it's going to bounce back. So normally, if you think about this, this is essentially a mirror. What you've done is you've created a mirror. You have a little bit of a different type of shape here because it's a prism, but don't worry about that. So normally, if you think of this system, you would get close to 100% reflection. And at most angles of incidence you do, you get close to 100% reflection. However, there's one particular angle where you actually couple into this surface plasma polariton. So it's very strange, because normally you're coming in at you know, 42 degrees, 100% of the light is reflecting off. But now, as soon as you hit 42.7 degrees, you basically get 0% of the light reflecting. And that means all the light is being coupled into the surface plasma polariton traveling across the interface. So again, um, this is very interesting from kind of a fundamental physics point of view. It's kind of cool to think of light that's traveling along the interface of a, of a metal. Uh, but you can also use it for a sensor here. And again, it's very sensitive to um, 
the refractive index of what's sitting on top of this material. So you can do exactly the same thing we did on the previous slide where you start to attach some sort of antibodies to here and you start to look at things attach and you can see a resonance shift. This is kind of a, a proof of concept example of that where they just compare a gold surface sitting in water, to, uh, sitting in air, to a gold surface that has a three nanometer layer of water. So three nanometers is really thin, that's about the size of kind of one of those individual molecules. And so all we've done is we put an extremely thin layer of water on the surface of this uh, gold film, and all of a sudden this resonance angle where you're coupling into the surface plasmon has shifted. And so this is called surface plasmon resonance, or um, SPR sensing, and people use this um, to sense very sensitively um, small molecules. So those are a couple examples of biological sensing. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm giving kind of a very quick overview of a lot of different topics of, of nano, um, nanophotonics. So another area that's been fairly hot since about 2000, so essentially this area of research of, of photonic metamaterials didn't exist before the year 2000, but since then till now, people have done a lot of research on it. And the main idea here is that you can start to create um, materials with really exotic properties, so things like negative refractive indices, things like optical cloaking materials. Uh, if you can nanostructure materials on, on sizes below the wavelength. So all of these show different approaches of essentially combining, in most of these cases, combining metals and dielectrics, although you can also do it with different types of dielectrics. But if you can start to pattern um, these materials, either in three dimensions or in two dimensions, but the feature size of your patterning is much smaller than the wavelength of the light, you can start to create all these exotic properties of materials. And so I'll show a couple examples of these. So the reason why it's taken so long to do this, one of the main reasons is, um, is actually the fabrication challenges. So it's really hard to start fabricating these types of structures with this type of resolution. So one of the first things to think of here is negative refractive index material. So it takes a little bit of thought to figure out exactly what this means. So one of the first places to start usually is looking at Snell's law. So that's kind of one of the basic ideas behind optics is that if you have some light ray coming in from refractive index N1, and then it's going to go into another material with refractive index N2, you can figure out the angle at which that light ray gets bent. And so Snell's law is N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. And then you can also look at the phase velocity of the light in t inside these two materials. So that's C, which is the speed of light in a vacuum, divided by the refractive index of these two materials. So the question is, what happens when N2 is negative? So a few interesting things happen. One is, if you just take this equation, if N2 becomes negative, the left-hand side stays the same. That means theta 2 has to become negative. So rather than this light ray going up, this light ray is going to come down. It's going to come down here. And you're also going to see an interesting thing here in that the phase velocity, V2, is also going to be negative. So C is a positive number, but now if N2 is negative, V2 is negative. So somehow what this means is that the light is going to be traveling backwards, and the angle is going to be down into this lower quadrant here. So how, what does this mean? How can you have a light ray coming in here, and then somehow that light ray travels here, but it's actually going backwards? And so the easiest way to look at this is actually to look at a couple videos on YouTube. So here's one video. So this is a simulation. Um, so what you're seeing here is you're essentially seeing the wave. So this is like the electric field coming into the material. It's coming in at some angle, and it's hitting this dielectric interface. And now you can sort of see how the angle is now negative, but the wave is traveling backwards, right? So in this material that has a negative refractive index, the wave is traveling backwards. Um, but that's the phase velocity. So I don't know if you guys have learned about the difference between phase velocity and group velocity. Um, group velocity is the kind of the direction of power flow. So the wave is going backwards, but the power that the wave is carrying is still going forwards is kind of how to solve this paradox. Once it reaches the normal material again, now the wave just continues back in, in the same direction it's going. So this would be an electromagnetic simulation of something with negative refractive index. Um, so that's one example. So another example of this is, let's say that instead of having a plane wave coming in, you have um, a point source. So now you have a point source here. So you now have a point source that's radiating, and now these waves, again, are kind of going backwards, but the angle of incidence of these light rays is now different, right? This point source has light rays going at all sorts of different angles. You come through your negative material, you get something kind of like a focus here, and now you end up on the other side with another focus, it's gonna, it would take a little while to kind of form perfectly, the simulation doesn't run long enough, 
but essentially you've created an image, right? So you have a point source here, it's sending out light, and you have on the right-hand side you have another point source that essentially that image has been formed. So with this negative index material, you've been able to create a lens. So this is exactly an imaging lens, but the difference is these interfaces are flat. So normally if you create a lens, you need to have curved pieces of glass. Here you've done it with something that's completely flat. And interestingly, this lens, in theory, can have no diffraction limit, um, which is a little bit complicated to get at. But it's theoretically possible to image better than lambda over 2. Um, one reason is because essentially the wavelength in here is a little bit weird to define, right? So you might have something that's kind of like a negative wavelength or something like that. But in theory, you can do better than that. In practice, it's actually not really possible um, for a variety of reasons. But people were very interested in that for kind of the first five years of 2000 until people kind of theoretically showed that the tolerances you would need to be able to have to do this are so kind of impossible to get um, to actually do significantly better. But it's still kind of an interesting theoretical concept. Okay. So people, um, how do you create these materials? Uh, what you need to do is you need to have um, materials with negative electric permittivity. So that's usually epsilon, which is not that difficult because metals can have that. But then you also need to have a negative magnetic permeability, and that's the part that's more difficult. Um, but the way people do that is by creating um, these types of nanostructures. And a lot of these nanostructures have something that's kind of like a loop. There's some sort of spiral or some sort of loop. And if you think of electricity traveling in a loop, that's like an inductor and that has some sort of magnetic resonance. And that's how you can kind of get these magnetic resonances. Um, but again, it's, it's still very difficult to do that at um, small length scales. Okay. So no natural materials have this negative N2, but you need to do some sort of nanostructuring, some sort of metamaterial, combined material to be able to create this. So another kind of very popular and flashy application here is the idea of optical cloaking. So again, the idea, let's say you have some sort of point source of light and you have an observer sitting over here. The goal is that if your observer is kind of anywhere here, what this observer sees is it looks like the light from this point source just came in a straight line. And so you can imagine this being a ray trace where you have to kind of bend the light around your object. So you can put whatever object you want inside this region and it's always going to look like there is nothing here at all. Um, so there are two things you have to do. One is you have to bend the light around it. The other thing is that you have to make sure that the total optical path length is the same, which is going to require refractive indices um, below one. So you need kind of exotic control of refractive index, and you can start to create um, these types of things. Uh, so those are interesting applications. Um, people have shown kind of examples of this at first in microwave frequencies, which is a little bit easier to do the fabrication, but there are also examples um, at at the nanoscale um, in visible frequencies too. Okay, so let me see how I'm doing. Okay, so I should go through this pretty quickly. So Bob Norwood talked a quite a bit about this, so I don't need to say too much about it. So another major area of nanophotonics has to do with computing with light. Uh, and you can use photons rather than electrons to enable computing. Um, so wavelength multiplexing, he talked a lot about the idea of being able to put multiple wavelengths into a single fiber. Another big advantage of using, um, using light is it's actually more energy efficient to, trick, to convey data um, using light than it is using uh, copper, for example. Uh, so another major example is modulating light on chips. So he showed an electromagnetic modulator. Uh, and he mentioned that essentially you apply an electromagnetic field to this material and you can use that to change the refractive index. So what that has to do with is electric field. And the units of electric field are volts per meter. So if you need to create a really large electric field, there are two ways you can do it. One is you can have a huge voltage, or you can have a really small length scale. Um, so if you have a really small length scale, the ratio of volts per meters tends to be um, pretty large, and you can actually start to modulate these things. So if you can miniaturize your, your device, you can get greater performance. You can essentially improve your modulation. Uh, there are also hybrid electro-optic devices, so the idea is you somehow want to um, either use electrical signals to control optical signals or use optical signals to control electrical signals. And so in data centers, this all has to happen, right? Somehow you need to, um, some of the data computationally is being performed using electricity um, in standard computers, and then, but then when you send that data from one computer to another computer, you want to do that optically. And one of the difficult things here is that um, there's a length scale mismatch between um, the scale of transistors on a chip and then the scale of light in things like optical fibers. 
And so somehow you have to be able to bridge um, that length scale mismatch. And so this is a sort of idea. So this is a, a 14 nanometer process. So this is a few years old now, but in general standard, you know, uh, you know Intel chips that you buy um, might have this type of uh, length scale. And in this case, what this means is that the, the kind of pitch between transistor elements is about 42 nanometers. So that's the size of your, your transistor on, um, on, your, on your chip, on your computer chip. And, but it, if you're thinking about the size of the length scale at which light is being um, carried, so this is, the, again, the idea that you have your optical fiber. So this is the same picture where you have this huge cladding and small core. Even though the core is pretty small, 8.2 microns, there's still a huge length scale mismatch between the size of that core and the size of these chips. So if you want to try to interface electronics and uh, optics, you somehow need to bridge this gap between transistor dimensions and diffraction limit. And nanophotonics provides a way to do that. So if you can start to do things like carry light along the interface of a metal, you can now start to shrink um, essentially the, the smallest length scale with which you can carry or transport that light. And that's one possible way of bridging that gap. Uh, so other examples of, of how nanophotonics is useful in computing are things like shrinking data storage devices for speed and capacity. Uh, and then plasmonics, which I've talked about here, is one option. Another option that people look at a lot is photonic crystals, which I'm not going to talk about too much, but that's another aspect of, uh, of nanophotonics here. So very briefly here, I might skip through most of this, um, is what our lab is working on. So our lab is the Soft Nanophotonic Systems Lab. And we're interested in this kind of intersection between nanophotonics, which is what I've been talking about. Um, so things like super resolution, optical sensing of nano objects, um, optical fabrication and nano patterning, and then optical properties of subwavelength structures. So it's the intersection between that concept with soft materials like liquids, polymers, um, colloidal materials, so nanoparticles floating around in liquid, uh, looking at those surface forces, so how do these nanoparticles floating around in liquid interact with each other, these sorts of questions. And then the last area is systems. So the idea is we're going to have a lot of um, components interacting together. So again, uh, one of the major systems we deal with are these colloidal systems where we have you know, millions of nanoparticles floating around. And how do these um, nanoparticles uh, interact with each other? And how can we use them to kind of assemble larger devices? So that's one of the main areas we're working on. So this is one example of, uh, of a research that I did for my PhD. Um, and in this case, what we were doing was we were using uh, optical tweezers to essentially optically trap these small little particles. And we were optically trapping them very close to a substrate. And we were using these as a lens. So remember how I said essentially the best you can do with a lens is lambda over 2? One way around that is to actually put your focusing element or your focusing object much smaller than lambda. So in this case, the gap between this sphere that we're trapping, so this is about a 1 micron diameter sphere, and the substrate that we're wanting to use essentially write patterns on, this gap is about, uh, it's about 10 nanometers, so 10 to 50 nanometers. And if you're at that very small length scale, you can actually do better than lambda over 2. Um, and so this is one thing we showed. So in this case, we have four of these little microspheres optically trapped. So uh, optical trapping, the idea behind optical trapping is you can use a laser beam to actually hold a particle. So it's like optical tweezers. So you can use laser beam as tweezers to hold these particles. These particles are each acting like lenses for a secondary laser beam. And then we're firing the secondary laser beam through here, and we're able to write out these patterns. And if you look in detail, the, the kind of finest length scale on this pattern is below 100 nanometers. So it's pretty small in that case. So one thing that we're continuing to do um, right around, so that, that was kind of almost 10 years old now. Um, but one thing that we're doing now is we're trying to extend our use of optical tweezers for nanofabrication um, and go beyond this 2D patterning and actually do some 3D patterning. But one of the major questions here is how quickly can we do this? And so these are some kind of typical papers from other groups looking at using optical tweezers for micro and nanofabrication. Um, in most cases, they're using microscale particles, and they're going at speeds of a few tens of microns per second up to this was the fastest we found, about 100 microns per second. And so the ultimate idea is that we want to drag particles um, from our reservoir and then attach them onto a structure that we're going to build. And the idea is that we can use different types of particles so we can start to integrate these dielectrics and these metal particles to start to create these interesting metamaterials. But how long can we do this? If it takes years to build just one device, it's not that useful. So one important question is how quickly do we think we can do this? So what we've been looking at is, is essentially the, the kind of fundamental limit here, which is how quickly can we drag a particle through, the, through the, um, the trap? So these are these small little colloidal particles floating around in water. And we're trying to drag them at very high speed through the liquid. So there's some sort of drag force. It's essentially just w like wind resistance, but it's through the liquid. And then there's this optical tweezer force. 
And so we're going to do this over a length scale of about a millimeter. Um, so we're going to grab this particle, drag it as fast as we can about a millimeter. And if we could keep it in the trap, we're then going to ramp up the speed, try again, ramp up the speed until eventually we're going faster than we can keep it in and it would lose the particle. So if we do this um, at low laser powers, um, we can, there's kind of a, a linear relationship between the maximum speed with which you can drag the particle and, uh, and the laser power. But eventually, once you start to turn up your optical trapping laser power too high, um, that linear relationship breaks down. And so we're interested in what kind of causes that and what leads to that. Um, but we've been able to find a couple different causes. Um, some cases, it's our hardware. So it's, it's really just a technical challenge. In some cases, we're actually starting to heat up the particles too much, and we're starting to lose them from the trap. Um, but we've been able to get speeds that are particularly high, higher than um, kind of the other, the other studies that we found in this case. So we think this is kind of competitive and, and a good way to go for, for fabricating these devices. Another major area that we're working on in our lab um, is something called lens-free optical microscopy for nanoparticle sensing. And this was something that I was working on uh, as a postdoc before I came here. And this platform is, you can think of this as a microscopy platform, but without any lens involved. So all we have is we have a light source, we have a transparent sample, and then we have an image sensor. So this image sensor is exactly the same type of image sensor you might find on a cell phone camera. And the reason why we're interested in this is because we can get a very large field of view. So we can actually see a very large area at the same time as getting good resolution. It's also a very simple, portable, and inexpensive device here. So the way this imaging works is actually a holographic imaging approach. And what we actually image is this interference between light that's being scattered off of our objects and light that goes through kind of transparent or clear regions of the sample. And so we start to see these interference patterns. If you think of light as a wave, it might kind of make sense why you start to see interference patterns. What we can then do is we can take these interference patterns and we can computationally reconstruct images of our sample. So in this case, we're looking at kind of small beads or small particles. And you can see how each one of these small particles led to all these different interference patterns. So this step is done using Fourier transforms and using Fourier optics to reconstruct that. So this shows one example of how we're able to achieve, at the same time, our huge field of view with very, uh, very good resolution. Um, this is sort of the scale bar, so we can see a few millimeters by a few millimeters on one of these image sensors. So again, it's the same sort of image sensor you'd get here. If you compare this to a, the field of view of a typical 40x microscope objective lens, um, it's a much, much larger field of view. However, the resolution is fairly comparable in this case. And um, so we can get resolution that's comparable to that of a, of a 0 0.9 and a uh, microscope objective with this approach. So one of the main things, uh, one of the main projects we're working on in, in our lab is to actually use this to be able to sense particularly small particles. So this is a microscopy approach. How did, what does this have to do with nanophotonics? The idea is, is there a way that we can use this approach to sense particles smaller than about 250 nanometers? Um, this is useful for things like um, biomedical imaging of viruses, also for things like environmental monitoring. And one of the main challenges here is actually these small particles just start to look like background noise. And so one of the approaches we've been using to kind of boost the scattering signature of these particularly small particles is we vapor condense a very small and thin polymer film. So we vapor condense a thin polymer film of polyethylene glycol, which is abbreviated as PEG here. And because of surface tension, this is actually a, a liquid at room temperature, you get this little meniscus effect. This meniscus effect actually allows us to be able to see these really small particles with high contrast. And so our previous limit without this, without these nanolenses is about 250 nanometers. With these nanolenses, we can go down to about 40 nanometers is about as small as we can see in this case. And so we're trying to kind of improve this more to be able to see even smaller things and get kind of all the way through the virus size scale and down to the individual protein size scale. So other lens-free um, imaging applications here, I might just skip through this quickly, but we've, we've kind of used it to label cells and look at different types of cells. Um, one example here that tends to be um, very well suited for this are these types of problems where you have a needle in a haystack. So this is pap smear imaging. So this is the main, the primary diagnosis um, technique for cervical cancer. And what people look for is you'll take a pap smear slide, someone will stain it, and then a pathologist will look at thousands of cells in this slide. And what they're looking for is they're looking for cases where the individual nuclei of the cell are large compared to the cell body. So these all look fairly normal because they have these dark spots here are the cell nuclei and then the colored larger areas are the cells. If you have one where the nucleus of the cell is like almost the full size of the cell, then that's an indication that you might have some sort of cancer sample, and that is then going to be a problem. And 
typically people need to look at thousands of cells and clear all these cells. So you can't just look at a small region of interest like this, but you need to look at a really large field of view, but at the same time have subcellular resolution. So this is one, one good application for this. Another interesting application is that you can do 3D reconstruction. So this is actually imaging of um, sperm swimming in three dimensions. And because that last step where we go from those interference holograms to the in-focus uh, image of our sample, that last step is done computationally. And that enables us to, um, to kind of refocus at lots of different planes and actually do 3D imaging. Um, and so we can pick out interesting trajectories. here. So I will end with that. Uh, so this is kind of a summary slide of the, of the central themes of nanophotonics. Uh, you can almost divide it into kind of two main areas. One is using light to gain information about nanoscale objects, and the other is confining light in order to interact with nano objects. And so kind of the approaches for these two concepts are different. Uh, I talked about a number of different application areas, including things like microscopy, biosensing, plasmonics, photonic metamaterials, computing using light, um, nanomaterials processing and characterization. And then one thing to keep in mind also, which I, I didn't talk about too much here, but is the, the difference between Sometimes what you care about is resolution, which is can you see two objects that are really close together, um, versus localization, which is how accurately can you tell where one object is positioned. And we talked a little bit about that. And then at the end is sensitivity, which is if there's how small of an object can you actually detect. So it's not necessarily can you detect two small objects next to each other, but if there's just one small object by itself, can you detect it? And so these are all kind of important distinctions depending on what application you're looking at. So my office is in 623, um, my lab is in 667, so it's open for lab tours tomorrow afternoon, 1 to 3 p.m., and you can also stop by my office. Um, my door's usually open, too, so if you're around and you want to talk, um, I'd be happy to. If you have any questions now, feel free to ask those, too. Yes.